Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to our latest Industry Day AI for Supply Chain. Today we have a, uh, um, a great agenda for you. And without getting to that, let's uh, turn over and make a nice warm welcome to uh, Mary Wells, our Dean of Engineering. And then we'll have some further welcome from Rauf Utaba from uh, CS. Please, Mary, if you could uh, give a nice welcome. Thank you so much, Harold, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome from Waterloo Engineering, and I just want to thank you for participating in this Industry Day event. As the Dean of Engineering, uh, these events, ones that work to create new partnerships and collaborative research opportunities, are really of great interest. Our strong connection with industry is one of the key factors in both our student success and in the immediate and tangible value of our research work. Waterloo Engineering has always had a strong mandate to ensure our research work goes beyond imagination. That is, actually makes an impact in the world. But to do that, it really must be grounded in real world needs. As all of you know, I think machine learning and AI are revolutionizing supply chains. And hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about that today. Driven by the convergence of increased data availability, advances in computing technology, and global and interconnected supply chain networks, innovative algorithms are transforming the future of supply chain planning. Studies suggest that AI can deliver unprecedented value to supply chain and logistics operations, from cost savings through reduced operational redundancies and risk mitigation to enhance supply chain forecasting and speedy deliveries through more optimized routes to improve customer service. Connections begin at events like this. Yes, hopefully even in a remote or virtual environment. So we are very enthusiastic about today's Waterloo AI Industry Day related to the supply chain. It is in events like this that we can celebrate and reinforce what we at Waterloo have always known that bold collaboration makes us all smarter and stronger together. I just want to congratulate Harold and VJ and Jimmy um, and the other organizers of this Industry Day event as the agenda for today looks very impressive with an extensive lineup of topics and speakers. Have a great day everyone and may some of the connections begin and enjoy yourselves. Thank you Harold. Thanks, Mary. And now I'd like to turn it over to Raouf. Uh, if Raouf could uh, please welcome our guests. Yeah, thank you, uh, Harold. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Um, fortunately, Mark Gisbrecht, the Dean of Math, has another commitment and could not make it uh, here today. So on his behalf and that of the Faculty of Mathematics, I would like to welcome everyone to this event of the Waterloo AI Institute dedicated to supply chains. The Waterloo AI Institute is very important to the Faculty of Mathematics, and we have been working together with the Faculty of Engineering and other faculties at Waterloo to support this important institute. So it can, in turn, support the industry and faculty colleagues and students uh, throughout the transformation brought about by recent progresses in AI and machine learning, uh, which are impacting almost every aspect of our society, economy, and the industry. The support of the Faculty of Mathematics to the Waterloo AI Institute includes, among others, contributions from very strong research groups in AI and data systems, in the School of Computer Science, uh, Data Science and Statistics, in the Department of Statistics and Actuar Actuarial Science, and operational research in the Department of Combinatorics and Optimization, which is particularly relevant to today's event. It also includes highly secret programs at the undergrad and grad levels in data science and artificial intelligence. Let me welcome you once again to this event. There isn't a better time than now to address important issues pertaining to supply chains, considering the challenges and disruptions faced by this industry worldwide. AI plays a very important role already in the area of supply chains and has an opportunity to play an even greater role going forward. I see that Waterloo AI Institute has put together a wonderful program. I wish you all a very productive event. <laughs> Very sound. Excellent. Thanks so much, Raouf. So I'd like to uh, pull up the agenda for today. Before I jump into that, we've had Mary talk from the Faculty of Engineering and Raouf from CS and Mathematics. Waterloo AI is all across all six faculties here at the university with over 225 researchers. So today you're going to hear from some, some other areas to present about uh, you know, AI for supply chain. 
uh, we have uh, Samir, we have Fatma, we have Meridad and, and his uh, colleague from Germany. And then uh, I'm going to get into a little bit of uh, what do we have ahead for you as uh, initiatives for the Waterloo AI and how we keep trying to bring back value to you as partners. And then our keynote for today, which is an excellent presentation, is from one of our, our existing partners in AI for supply chain and focusing on data culture. So without further delay, I'd like to uh, turn over to uh, Samir. And um, but, but one last thing, I, you know, who is Waterloo AI? Waterloo AI is, uh, as I said, we've already got 225 researchers, but we also have um, two more Im important people above me, which is my co-directors. And we have uh, uh, Vijay Ganesh, a co-director from an engineering side, and Jimmy Lin, who is our uh, co-director from uh, Mathematics CS. So you're, when you reach out as a partner, uh, I'm there to represent and connect with industry, but if you're looking for a more academic uh, connection, we can handle whichever way the inquiries come in. So let's get on with today's events. And um, we have um, Samir is our first presenter. Uh, if Samir is ready. We could uh, pull up his, um, his presentation. So Samir is a professor at the Department of Management Science at the University of Waterloo. His research interests are in large-scale optimization and data analytics. His work has appeared in top scientific journals such as Management Science, Mathematical Programming, uh, Manufacturing and Service Operations Manual. Uh, he has research grants from NSERC, CFI, OCE, and MITAX and collaborated with industry in aircraft manufacturing, aircraft scheduling, and supply chain analytics. He was chair um, of the Department of Management Science from 2004 to 2018. So with a little bit of an intro there, Samir, I'm going to turn the screen over to you and, uh, and uh, share all your insights on AI for supply chain. Thank you, Harold, for the nice intro. Um, so just to make sure, do you see my screen? Do you see my slides? Uh, I think we can see your slides, yeah? Okay, Starts fantastic. Off. There you okay. go. Okay, um, so uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I think it comes at a, a very good time where there is a huge need for uh, supply chain efficiency as we face disruptions and uncertainties and shortages of supplies and so on. So this talk will be um, a high level talk, uh, essentially talking about these and what's the best way to address them, at least from the, an AI and a talent perspective. So I'm going to do um, a brief introduction um, on supply chains and you can see in there I'm using the title and I'm highlighting different um, phrases and keywords in the title and when I come to each one of them I'll, I'll give a brief introduction to kind of build some context around um, the message I would like uh, you to uh, get from this presentation. So as you know supply chains, um, although in this figure I presented as a three level supply chain, um, with manufacturing, distribution, and consumption, but supply chains can also include uh, tier one suppliers, tier two suppliers, and uh, uh, distribution, warehousing, retail, and then even recycling, and so on. Um, it's typically characterized by a forward flow of materials. So you have raw material, and then you have uh, sub-assemblies, and then you have final products, and, and, and then so on. And typically also characterized by a backward flow of information, um, of cash, obviously. Somebody has to pay for the products, and they have to flow all the way back to the suppliers and also of, of defective material and of recyclables. So uh, typically a supply chain is, um, uh, is composed of all these activities and all these players. Um, the decision makers a lot of times are not centralized in the sense that you have different players making different decisions. And the interesting thing is that over time, supply chains have gone through a couple of waves. So in the early days, I would say that manufacturing tends uh, to, tended to, um, to dominate supply chains in the sense that whoever produced the product had the upper hand and the final say in so many things. But then as um, uh, retailers or, or, or the consumer side of the supply chain realize that actually who pays for the product are the consumers and retail is at least the final stage in the supply chain and the one presenting the product, 
the way it shifted towards retail and you've seen giants on the retail side dominating the supply chain, dominating the contracting within the supply chain, the pricing, the availability, and we've seen uh, the manufacturing side sometimes uh, playing a key role within 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 the, the retail side in terms of uh, vendor managed inventories, for example, in terms of responsibilities for warranties and so on. But the most recent trend, which is very interesting now, is that distribution, the central node in the supply chain, um, is starting to have the upper hand. And what I mean by that is that warehouses um, essentially selling through online uh, channels and through e-commerce is starting to have the upper hand. And this is fueled by many things. Obviously, the recent pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, is one of them. Now, just... Um, a final note about this is that supply chains or, or any product in general or any market is driven by demand. So there is demand for a certain product and there is supply on the other hand or there are entities willing to provide that supply. And then um, you try to find the best resources to meet that demand from supply. So uh, in a nutshell, it's, 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 a, it's a matter of uh, satisfying demand um, from supply and providing the right resources to achieve it. Now, obviously, when you have different players, then you get into competitions, you get into choice, you get into customers having a say on what um, should be, uh, what the product should be in terms of its impact, in terms of its quality and so on. And that's why throughout the years as well in supply chains, there was a focus initially on what are called efficient supply chains or cost efficient supply chains, meaning you have a product that is delivered at the minimum cost to the, to the consumer. But then once that was done and then people realized that there are other things that matter to the consumer other than cost, we started talking about time sensitive supply chains or responsive supply chains. So somebody makes an order online and they want the product as soon as possible. And so this led to a multitude of research and a multitude of paradigms in terms of achieving this. For example, now computers, you can order a computer online and receive it within a couple of days. Now, the way to do it is obviously based on sub-assemblies being ready. The choices are not infinite. You have a couple of choices to make. And then the, 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 the final assembly is being done and record time is being delivered to the consumer as quickly as possible. Now, obviously, also um, in this trend uh, and, and consumers being aware about the impact um, uh, their products are having in the environment, um, there is a lot of work on green supply chains, on sustainable supply chains from a, an environment perspective, but also on sus uh, sustainable supply chains, at least from a cost and from also a consumer perspective. Um, and obviously now sustainability is more or less being equivalent to the ability of supply chains to handle um, uh, sudden spikes in demand and to be able to respond to um, a huge disruption such as the one we're seeing now because of the flooding um, out west or because of COVID-19. So this is very brief, uh, brief historical account of uh, the different ways of approaching supply chains and different objectives and uh, the um, different um, key players when it comes to who decides on uh, some of the key decisions in supply chains. Now related to this, and because this is mostly about AI for supply chains, I would like also to kind of give my view on AI. Um, and in the broad sense, in my opinion, data analytics would be a better description of this. And in here, you typically have data and they have big data there between parentheses, um, uh, because what you do with data doesn't have to be big data. At the start, there was a lot of push towards uh, big data and, 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 and how to deal with big data. But even this this approach could, could apply to um, a small data set that you can typically have in Microsoft Excel. So once you have the data, what you try to do is to try to get as much as possible from the data. And typically what one starts with is data visualization and you try to try uh, to, 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 do, to get some information from the data. This typically falls under what is called descriptive analytics. Now, once you know what the data holds and some key components in the data, then you try to use that information to predict what the future holds. And there are also a variety of ways to do it. This typically falls under predictive analytics. Now, once you know what the future holds, you can do um, better than 
having no information, and this typically falls under prescriptive analytics, which means you essentially try to make better decision making and try to optimize your operations and so on. You can do this using optimization techniques. You can do this also using or you visualize the effect of your changes using what are called simulations. So it could be discrete time simulation, it could be other forms of simulation. Now, all these techniques are there really, are they really new or are they techniques that we're putting together? Now, there are a multitude of factors that contribute to this. The sure thing is that AI is not a new term. Now, typically, and this is based on definitions because you can hear a, a multitude of definitions of what data science is and which is part of what, but this one, I'm taking it based on, on definition from the uh, NSF Foundation in the US that uh, is the equivalent of NSERC for us. So data science is typically um, dealing with the descriptive and the predictive parts um, of data. Whereas data analytics, on the other hand, it tends to um, deal more with the predictive and the prescriptive parts of data analytics, meaning the first one looks at the data and try to get key information from it. The second one, data analytics, takes that key information and tries to optimize and make better decision making. In my opinion, the two are complementary. Um, AI definitely depends on who you ask. There are different definitions. Uh, for some people, AI is equivalent to machine learning. For some people, it's equivalent to um, uh, deep learning. And, and for some people, it's equivalent to data science. But in my opinion, AI should be viewed as being um, another term for either data science or data analytics, because in terms of the power, in terms of what you can do with it, it really um, uh, intersects with, with both data science and data analytics. Now, in terms of um, uh, the general view of this, so typically the, 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 the thought is that you have data, you try to squeeze out information from that data, and you try to use that information to make better decisions. In terms of tools and techniques and disciplines used for this, you obviously need a lot of computer science, you need a lot of statistics, and you need a lot of operations research and optimization. And as you see the techniques, a lot of these uh, areas have contributed um, different algorithms um, to uh, different algorithms for data analytics, um, data science, and artificial intelligence tools. So this is very briefly my view of data analytics and AI, and this typically applies to a, a multitude of areas, but definitely applies to supply chain management. Supply chain management is very important because it affects our day-to-day -day life. It's very important because it involves lots of assets, it involves lots of big players and involves lots of cash. So if you optimize even one or 2%, it could have tremendous impact on the operation of that supply chain. So let's look at this, um, uh, how it applies to, to, to supply chain management and logistics. Now, we wanna make use of, uh, of resources in the best of way. And the way to do it is really to seek optimal decision making. Obviously, optimal is relative, and sometimes you don't even know whether you have the optimal decision or not until time passes. But there is one thing that is one could use, and that is how you use data, given that now there is a lot of data that is available through different entities in the supply chain, at the manufacturing, at the distribution, at the retail stage. So the traditional approach, and, and We've used a lot of this in, in, in trying to solve some of the supply chain problems is typically you look at a problem and say, OK, this is an important problem. Let's build a prototype for it. Let's play with it. And then later on, you think about uh, what data do I need for this problem and you try to improve it based on the data. So this is really what I call the classical approach or the expert based approach. Now, in my opinion, now with the availability of data, with the availability of computer power and with the availability of techniques and algorithms from AI, one could really adopt a data-driven approach or a data analytics approach or an AI approach. So obviously, data visualization is key. Then trying to understand the system under study from a data perspective. What I mean in here, and I want to make this distinction, instead of saying, though, this is a warehouse, this is a typical warehouse, I know the functions within a warehouse. No, let's look at the data, let's follow timestamps of the data and try to figure out how the warehouse actually functions. And by doing this, not only understand the process flow, you understand the layout, but you also identify possible areas of improvement through this exercise. Now, once you do this, you have a problem to work with and you have the data for it. You try to propose some solutions, you try to redesign the process, you try to re, uh, 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 
re-optimize certain elements of that process, and um, you have a solution. The nice thing about this solution is you can validate it because you have the data. So typically in a lot of approaches in, in algorithms in AI that you divide the data into a training sample and the, into a testing sample and so on. That's only one way of it. But there are different ways in which you can do this data driven optimization, trace optimization based on the data and so on. And some of the key techniques that one could use. Now back into the title again, it's enhancing supply chain efficiency with AI pressing needs. What are the pressing needs? So let's look at this. This is data uh, taken from um, Stats Canada, and it looks at um, e-commerce sales versus in-store sales from um, uh, 2016 to 2020. And here I'm going to take two data points. Uh, this is April 2019 and April 2020. And you see that in April 2020, um, there was a kind of a steady um, volume for um, in-store sales. Um, E-commerce was picking up, but if you compare that against April 2020, you see that in-store sales declined by about one third and e-commerce sales more than doubled during that period. Now, obviously we know, we all know what happened there. There are uncertainties related to supply, there are lockdowns because of COVID-19, and there are uh, social distancing measures, and a lot of people, including myself, opted for online shopping as opposed to in-store shopping. So there is a big boom in e-commerce and online shopping. So this is obviously, in my opinion, the number one pressing need to use the power of AI combined with the domain knowledge of supply chains to try and propose solutions for this. Now, also, I would like to share with you this slide and the source for it is the American Productivity and Quality Center. And you see in there that artificial intelligence is one of the uh, six um, anticipated uh, technologies to have an impact on supply chains by 2023. Now, if you look at the numbers in there, and the dark blue um, is major impact, the light blue is moderate impact, and you see for the major impact, digitization of the supply chain is number one. Artificial intelligence is number three, number four actually, because this goes 16, 15, 14, 13 percent. And in terms of um, uh, total impact, ma major and minor, you see that artificial intelligence is one of the top six. So obviously this has to do about um, uh, how to use artificial intelligence tools and techniques, integrate them with how supply chains um, operate and try to provide a better value both for the supply chain and the consumer. Now, um, I want to just finish this note by saying um, in order to be able to apply supply um, artificial intelligence data analytics tools, the supply chain should be at a certain state because a supply chain without products being sold at one end and without products being supplied at the other end does not exist. So the first thing is you have to make sure the well-being of the supply chain is not threatened. So in terms of sustainability of the supply chain itself, in terms of dealing with uncertainty, in terms of dealing with uh, security threats and so on, the supply chain is healthy and thriving. And then use AI either to enhance um, that healthiness of the supply chain or to uh, increase efficiency of the supply chain. Now, in terms of pressing needs and because of the sudden boom in e-commerce, I would like to focus on this particular um, uh, function of supply chains. So obviously uh, through online shipping, um, uh, one starts with order placement. Now that order placement goes into a certain warehouse and there should be an order preparation. So typically orders come the day before. Um, during the day, they work on the order, they put it in place and then they ship it. So order preparation and then order delivery. Now behind this, there should be um, an infrastructure and a system that should be able to do this. So at the order placement level, you obviously need um, a good electronic platform that could uh, transfer orders into warehouses and so on. And that by itself, the availability of the platform and the efficiency of the platform um, uh, is, a, is, is an element that needs more attention given the spike in e-commerce. Also, uh, the way you distribute orders from the platform into different warehouses, this is also another topic that needs a lot of attention. Now, on the order preparation um, level, uh, e-warehousing plays a big role. So typically within one of these warehouses, you have a lot of manpower, 
a lot of operations are being done manually. Also, um, there are some there is some automation which is starting to grow little by little, and there are key functions that run all over this highly automated, this highly dynamic warehouse. At the order level, distribution should be um, paid attention to, and how would you efficiently do it? Uh, do, do you do target distributions? Is the current capacity um, enough for that distribution? Do you need help? Um, do you need, I don't know, some sort of a sharing economy platform to do it, and so on. Now, an example of um, a problem that is typically treated, at least from a research perspective at the order placement level, is product assortment. So what are the products that I, I should keep? What level of inventories? And um, uh, how can I present them together for um, more sales or at least for efficient packaging together? At the order preparation time, order consolidation is key to the efficiency of a warehouse. So typically orders coming in the day before, they have to be acted upon uh, during the day and beyond the day you have let's say 1200 orders or whatever that have to be out the door in terms of distribution routing of vehicles um, do we do I uh, do targeted deliveries do I do um, uh, routing from one um, customer to another as they do in parcel delivery for example do I have enough capacity do I have to rely on a third party and so on so these are some of the problems that one could look at Obviously, within all of this, also, if you think about the impact of the supply chain, for example, in the environment, then that's also another problem in another level of complexity that one has to deal with. Now, impactful training, I'm, I'm, I'm at the, the last piece of the, uh, of the title here. So what do we need to do now? So obviously, there is a huge spike in e-commerce and online shopping. And here at the University of Waterloo, we did establish a program um, to deal uh, with this targeted at logistics and supply chain. And we call it the University of Waterloo Professional Training Program in Logistics and Supply Chain Analytics. And I would like to spend some time on it. Now, this program is um, um, funded by Scale AI. Uh, Scale is the federal supply uh, supercluster on uh, AI enabled supply chains, um, uh, which Waterloo was one of two entities that worked on the initial proposal that was eventually awarded. Now, what does this program do? It offers in-depth training in logistics and supply chain analytics, and it has equal emphasis on applications, analytics, and software. It covers key functional areas in supply chains, meaning manufacturing, distribution, retails, stores, warehousing, and so on, and em emphasizes hands-on experience with tools and software. And the overarching goal of all of this is better decision-making. Now, this program is targeting businesses, so a business unit at a time. Now, we have concluded the first offering of this program over the fall term. Um, um, our client, I believe, is um, very happy with the way it unfolded. Um, I should also share with you that at first, when we had this program um, set up and we're talking to some of our stakeholders, uh, the number one question was, how would you differentiate your product? There are so many um, training programs out there, but a lot of them talk about maybe theoretical aspects. They, they don't really delve into the real complexities that supply chains are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so our promise from the beginning was this is going to be hands on and this is going to be targeted at what problems you're going to be working on. And as I go through the structure of the program, you will see clearly how we do it. So trainees, um, the expected outcomes in terms of what we promise is that trainees will be exposed to key concepts in logistics and supply chain analytics. Obviously, we introduce them to data analytics, descriptive, pre uh, predictive and prescriptive. We also um, we also um, emphasize AI uh, tools to address a variety of decision-making problems in logistics and supply chain operations. And we focus on hands-on case studies and industry-focused projects. And we hope that by the end, they would build capacity um, in how to apply AI and analytics tools to a variety of situations. So essentially data-driven decision-making. 
Um, now, by the end of the project, they do also a focused capstone project using real data from their institution, and they use the techniques we've exposed them to during the um, uh, first couple of courses to try and solve these problems. I wanted to give just an overview about the pressing needs and what the combination of AI and supply chains could, could deliver. So obviously the main takeaways is that emerging technologies, for example, automation and connectivity, for example, IoT and so on, and certain uncertainties related to the pandemic, um, security threats, supply shortages are impacting supply chains on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is not new. What is new is the magnitude of, of these uncertainties that we are uh, facing now. So what we do is in times of crisis, we need to um, optimize the use of resources. And you see this all over when, whenever there is an urgent situation, you have to be careful about what, what, what to use. And obviously you have to optimize it either cost wise or time wise, but also in terms of distribution wise and in terms of fairness. And for example, in terms of COVID-19 in, in, in ways that better helps combat the pandemic and provides resources for the future to keep combating it. Now, there is growing need for talent in AI enabled supply chain. There are lots of studies that speak to this. Um, and this typically, at least in terms of the training program I went through, it emphasizes understanding data. So a lot of people work with data, but they don't have the means to actually look at the data and have some insights based on the data. Sometimes they would focus at a certain example, but that example, does it represent 1%, 2%, 10%, or is it 20% of the data? So these are some of the things that data visualization would help achieve. Now, once you have that information from the data, you try to predict whether the future has that same trend or not. And once you know that the future has that same trend, maybe you should reposition yourself, you reposition inventory, um, you, you increase the capacity of your tracking fleet and so on to better respond to it. So understand the data, extract information from the data and use it to make better decision making. And with that, I conclude the main message from this presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. OK, okay. Well, thanks, Samir. We have uh, a few questions I'd like to start with, and we have some others that are going to come in through the question and answer chat box. For all the attendees, if you have specific questions, please enter them there. OK, so to start off with, you mentioned, uh, you know, data drives all of this. You've you put a term out there of big data. How do you describe big data? Right, and what's not big data? Where's that threshold? Ex excellent question. And to be honest with you, um, uh, I'm going to cite one of the uh, projects I went through uh, with, with a global um, warehouse management company. And when we were first talking with them, um, they, uh, they they said that we have lots of data and this is big data, big data, big data. So when, when you get told this, the first thing you think about is where do I store this data? So we went back to the lab, which is the Waterloo Analytics and Optimization Lab, and we tried to buy a couple of servers to put the data and so on. And when we got the data, we were surprised that it was not big data. <laughs> it was big because it had so many things, but it's not big in terms of where to store it. In my opinion, um, we should let go. This is my personal of, of the word big. So data, whatever it is, has good information. If it is data that spans multiple periods or multiple functions within the supply chain, that's even better data. And for some applications, you need that sort of data. For some other applications, you need more granular, more accurate data to look at and to work with. So big, you can look at it in terms of what does it span within the problem that you are looking at, or big in terms of the size of it. But in my opinion, even small data would be good to work with. Now. I didn't answer your question, where does this th threshold lie in terms of the data? To be honest, one shouldn't focus too much on where it is. If it is big data that you need a big warehouse to store it, then take a portion of it and start working with it. Because that's usually the approach of how to deal with complex problems with complex data. You start with a small subset, you understand it, you uh, improve your skills of how to deal with it, and you keep growing it little by little. OK, so another uh, thank you for that. That's, that helps a lot. Um, I'd like you can consider that AI is a journey. And for some companies, even an SME, the criteria is up to 500 people and you still qualify as an SME. Where's the threshold of when they should start thinking about managing their you know, supply chain and really delving into this? Where's that, again, that threshold? Because we have all different partners on the call here and 
how did they get in? When is that? Oh, no, no, we're not a mega company. It's not for us. Where's that threshold again? That's a very good question. In my opinion, I would say start right away. But, you know, for anything that you try to implement, um, there is kind of a, a certain readiness phase in which you have to take your supply chain. So if you're dealing with, let's say, a very specific problem with your suppliers, I would say focus on that one first. Um, and this does not mean that you cannot um, uh, start using AI and in, in other functions, but if that is your pressing need, then focus on it first. And then once you see that your supply chain is in a steady state, then you start looking at the data and start applying AI. Having said that, I don't want to give the impression that wait and wait and wait. No, um, it's in my opinion, it's a good idea to have an AI or a data analytics culture within the company. That means data statistics don't lie. And if you have something that data is telling you, then it's a real problem that one has to attend to. I'm not saying that you have to attend to it right away, but it has to be on your to do list. So fix that problem with your supplier first that you know exactly how to address because maybe you don't have enough trucks in your trucking fleet to deal with it or one of your third party transportation companies is not um, uh, delivering on its promises. Deal with that first, but at the same time start working on this AI, uh, AI culture. Now, the thing is that, um, and which is true, is that also this AI culture has to be um, bottom up, meaning if um, top management start talking about AI, we're gonna use AI, and the rest of the decisions within the company don't adhere to this, then it's gonna be problematic. So in my opinion, starting with this AI culture is very important. And I wanna just um, uh, finish this uh, answer by relating it to the training program we had in place. Now, that was one of the key things we worked on. We didn't start saying, you know what, AI is great and implement it here. And we said, okay, let's look at some of the problems you guys are facing. And when I look at the problems, I can very quickly relate it to a certain AI technique that one could use. Obviously, the AI technique starts with the data and it goes through all the three phases of visualize what's going on, try to understand why it's happening this way, try to predict what this is going to be in the future and now take decisions right now on how on how to do it. Now, this comes also with the added uh, value of you have the data to back this up so that when you prepare a presentation for top management to convince them that, that this is something that has to be done now, you have all the data, all the analysis to convince them of it. OK, uh, well, you mentioned training. Um, there's also, you know, Waterloo AI is rolling out uh, some of their own training focused on different segment areas. We have a specific question here from the attendees that are asking eligibility criteria. So is your training focused on, you know, the data analyst, more the data engineer, uh, the decision makers in the company? Who's the best criteria to take this? And do they need to be experts in R and Python and things like this? Or elaborate, please. You've got another minute or two, and then we're going to... Uh, absolutely not. So so obviously, the, the group we worked with, uh, we didn't require them to be experts in, in, in programming and coding. And that was actually one of the first questions that we were asked. All we needed is computer savviness and willingness to work with numbers and with computers. And that's why we started even with, we didn't, we didn't require installing software like R or Python. Let's work on a shared cloud environment like Colab, for example. Let's work with Microsoft Excel in terms of simulation and optimization. We don't want you to delve into these high-end software. And from there, I think the, the, the steps should be that, let's look at the data, let's just stare at it and, and see what we could do with it. And little by little, you get people buying in and starting to do it. So I would say no um, background in, in coding is required because a lot of times you could do 80% of solving a problem you're looking at by simply strategizing on how to do it using simple tools. So the thinking is more important than the tools. Now in this training program, also we do a lot of hands-on, meaning it's not just lecturing. Three hours, open your computer, start this code, take this data set, play with it, asking questions, what does this mean? Why did we get it this way? Oops, we made a mistake right there. Let's look at it again and so on. And this is really what resonated well with all our trainees who are, I believe, are very happy based on feedback we received from them. OK, well, great. Well, thank you very much. You've, uh, you're exactly on time at 145. Thanks again, Samir, for your excellent thank you, talk. Harry. It was my pleasure.
and sharing. And uh, I'm at the end. I'm going to have my email for any follow up questions. If I get anything that comes to me, I'll bounce it forward to yourself. OK, with pleasure. Thank you so much. So um, we're going to now uh, keep going on with our agenda. We're going to talk to our if you can just hang on. Uh, Samir, your, your screen will be swapped out. Sure. Our next presenter is uh, Fatma Gazara. She's a professor. And let's just wait for the transitions of slides and and things there for Fatma. So I'm just going to introduce Fatma. So Fatma is a associate professor, a professor with the Department of Management Sciences at the University of Waterloo. Her research interests lie in the areas of optimization, network models, supply chain management, transportation risk and logistics. Currently, she uses bi-level mathematical modeling to determine the routes that trucks carrying hazardous materials will uh, Will most likely uh, take. Professor Gazara gathers real data and uses it to keep residential and industrial areas safe. In the last few years, she has written articles for journals such as Operations Research Letters, Telecommunication Systems, and the European Journal of Operational Research. So I'd like you all to uh, welcome uh, Fatma for her presentation. And please, any questions you have throughout, Please put them in the chat box and we'll address them towards the end of her presentation. Over to you, Fatma. OK, hi, Harold. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, I can. You're all good. OK, good. Well, thanks for inviting me um, to um, talk about my work in uh, supply chain analytics. Um, so just a correction, I'm actually a professor, no more an associate professor, and I'm also now serving as the associate chair for undergrad studies in management sciences, and I'm co-director of the Waterloo Analytics and Optimization Lab, and uh, based on the name of the lab, my expertise is in analytics and optimization, and supply chain is one of the major application areas where we apply these tools, analytics and optimization. Um, well, I, I want to thank the organizers for the order of the talks because uh, Samir's talk is a great um, introduction. If you want to my talk, he talked about supply chain and the need for supply chain and the boom in e-retailing. And uh, so uh, instead of a general approach, I'm going to be actually focusing on a, on a, um, a, a more detailed piece of work. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a collaboration with Dematic, which is a global leader in supply chain solutions. Um, and the uh, collaboration is in the space of e-warehousing. E um, so through this application, I'm going to uh, talk to you not necessarily about the details, but more of high level, just to show you uh, the journey. And then uh, why do we take that journey and what is the impact from that journey? Um, and you know, when this project um, um, was carried out um, before the pandemic, um, we had to justify why do we work on e-warehousing. Uh, but now we don't. We don't need to, <laughs> to justify why we need to work on e-warehousing just because of the boom in, in, in e-warehousing, uh, partly because of the pandemic and uh, recently because of all of the kinds of uh, environmental issues that are happening across the world and the best um, I guess a recent example, I, I shouldn't be, say best, if, in fact, because it's not a good occurrence. It's the flooding in, in BC. And as soon as the flooding started, we started uh, receiving calls um, to um, talk about from news agencies to talk about the impact of um, such events like flooding on uh, the disruption in the supply chain. There was already talk about uh, all the disruptions and delays in supply chains because of the pandemic and people were worried about um, their Christmas shopping and now adds to it, um, you know, um, flooding and, and probably snow, snowstorms uh, soon. So, um, I mean, the uh, one of the figures that Samir showed shows the a huge increase in, in the need for e-warehousing. Um, so uh, it's across the globe, there is a, at least a double doubling in the need for e-warehousing um, over the last two years. Um, and in fact, um, many uh, areas are running out of space 
for uh, warehousing. So efficient warehousing is going to help in that aspect too. So an interesting statistic is that Waterloo region is one of the regions where um, they are running out of uh, industrial space um, on less than an availability of less than 2% and it's among the uh, top three uh, with least availabilities, including Toronto and Vancouver. Um, okay, so um, the when we started working on, on the project, um, Dematic, um, obviously, um, um, they provide uh, warehousing solutions, um, machinery, actually, technology, and uh, because of the automation in warehousing, there is huge of data that's being um, um, uh, generated and can we say that's uh, big data or not big data? I guess yes, you can say it's big data if you think about it of the data generated over a long period of time. Um, it's also big data because it's very complex. So it's huge amounts of data generated by all kinds of machineries that the Matic did not know about, did not know what to do about, but they knew one thing, they knew that there is value in that data and if used properly or explored properly, then there can, there can be value for um, the, uh, the company itself and then for the supply chains or e-warehousing operations in general. Um, so uh, the e-warehousing is complex because it deals with small orders. Uh, so for example, Amazon warehouses, the average uh, number of uh, SKUs or items per order is less than two. And so it's uh, so very small orders um, that's basically harder to um, assemble within the warehouse. And then a huge assortment. If you go to a, a store, you are limited to what's on the, on the, on the, um, what's available on the shelves. But in uh, online, everything is available. So basically, you, when you search in, a, in an online uh, platform, you can find anything you want. So that's, uh, that basically tells you that the e-warehouse has uh, an infinite uh, assortment, which is, again, because of the scale, it's hard to manage. Um, e-warehousing also has tighter delivery uh, uh, due dates than uh, usual um, you know, uh, procurement channels. Uh, just because when you it's so easy to order, you expect your order to be there right away. Um, and um, it's so dynamic as an operation, uh, both in terms of the demand and in terms of the work workforce. Um, and so putting all of this together and the amounts of data, there is a huge opportunity to um, use that data to improve the operation. Um, to uh, identify issues and, and solve them using, um, you know, smart tools. So the purpose from the, um, the project, again, is to build analytics tools for um, automated warehousing operations. Um, and uh, our approach is uh, that of data analytics. So we want to learn from the data, we want to predict behavior, and we want to prescribe actions to uh, guide uh, the decision making. Um, so I guess I will not comment a lot about the relationship between this and AI. I think it's obvious that that's why we are, uh, we are members of the AI Institute and that's why we were invited to talk here. But also Samir touched, touched upon this, the relationship between data analytics and, and AI. Um, I think in data analytics, probably I would say my opinion, the, um, the most, um, you know, if, if, if I want to say what's, one thing that um, why I, why I call it data analytics and not just AI is because of the emphasis on the last piece, which is the prescriptive um, uh, prescriptive part, uh, where we use uh, mo mostly optimization and and operations research tools um, to to uh, address those questions. Um, okay, so. Um, so here is an example of the type of data that we had. Um, it's just timestamps uh, of anything that happens in the warehouse. And um, we had the challenge of um, not only analyzing the data, but an understanding the process of itself from the data. Um, so obviously, if we accumulate this data over a long period of time, it becomes huge amounts of data. But then do we really need to know a whole year's operation to, to uh, come up with some an val val valid analysis? The answer is most likely not. And so, for example, we only used eight days of operation. Uh, and during those eight days, there were 10,000 orders processed through this e-warehouse. 
um, there was uh, there was uh, 250,000 more than 250,000 SKUs um, uh, processed, and then uh, in in a single day there were more than 30,000 SKUs, uh, you know, processed through the warehouse. Um, so it's huge amounts of data, but it's still manageable um, in terms of storing it on a on a on a you know a, a machine. But then it's complex. It's complex because there's no way we can figure out that data or understand it without uh, some significant data processing. Um, so the first step is to learn um, the warehouse operations from the data and to identify inefficiencies. And um, the, I guess one question that could come to mind is, why do I need to use the data to understand the warehouse operations? I should be able to know that. Um, so there are two reasons why we started off um, as, you know, basic as learning the warehouse operations is that uh, Dematic actually does not operate warehouses. They only operate the machinery, so they don't necessarily have a full picture of the warehouse. So if they want to, gen to uh, build generalizable and uh, analytics tools that not only apply for this warehouse, but apply across warehouses, then they, they do not uh, should not require the uh, layout of the warehouse, for example, or the specifics of the operation of the warehouse. They should only uh, use the data to, to um, come up with, with the tools. And so that was our first challenge. How can we understand the operation, come up with the uh, logistics strategies that are used there, come up with the flows, come up with the relationships between the different entities without uh, even uh, having a flow chart from the warehouse or without even knowing what these numbers mean um, in terms of hardware, in terms of types of SKUs, or we didn't know the, what's the, what the warehouse for, like the warehouse, we didn't know the actual operator of the warehouse, whether it was, uh, you know, um, Amazon or, or whoever, we don't know, or Tim Hortons or so there is lots of warehouses that use the MATIC technology and uh, we, did need, we did not need that information in fact. So I'm going to show you a couple of um, visualizations that enabled us to uh, understand the operation and, and um, basically recreate the warehouse. And if you want, we kind of came up with a digitized warehouse through the analysis of the data. Um, so from simple, you know, uh, frequency plots and um, uh, to more complicated visualizations of the flows in, in the warehouse, um, so there is, you, you can uh, focus on different types of entities or activities and then um, uh, using some uh, software in R basically um, or through what we call, um, you know, simulation, but based on the real data, we could c come up with uh, process flows um, for specific uh, activities. And the reason why this is helpful, this is going to show us the logical relationships um, of anything that happens in the warehouse. Um, that's one thing. So the arrows, the, the nodes basically show us the different processes or different activities or different machinery. And then um, the arcs show us the flow of um, activities between the different, um, the, the different nodes. Um, the uh, arcs, the thickness of the arc and the percentage on it shows how, min, how much flow happens on that arc. So basically, you can identify things like congestion um, in here. You can identify um, things, um, activities that are not used sufficiently or activities that are overused. And that helps you uh, basically move or reorganize um, your warehouse and your plans to improve uh, the efficiency of the warehouse overall. Um, also, for example, on the top one, we have a time and that's the time it takes to go from one place to the other. Um, so these are three um, flow charts of different types of activities that are happening on the same warehouse and uh, they all lead us to conclude certain things about the warehouse. First, the logical relationships. So basically, um, this tells me what machinery is there and how does, um, the, do, does the material move throughout the warehouse. And then it shows us um, if there is any congestions or underutilizations of any of the resources that starts to guide us towards 
um, what's going on in this warehouse, what's being done well, and what are the inefficiencies. And so the next would be how do we improve the inefficiencies? So um, this is, for example, another plot that shows um, an, an ordered, um, it, it, it's an ordered uh, figure. Um, you can think of this as a time, time-based um, plot uh, or just the order of events happening in the warehouse. And again, it shows, um, you know, there's obviously some arcs that are extremely thick compared to others. And so that's, those are probably, if I want to start improving things, I probably should start that there because that captures the majority of, of my activity in the warehouse. So I should be starting there and then going through the others. So um, from all of these plots and uh, lots of other uh, data manipulations and data, data visualizations, we were able to uh, digitize the warehouse. So come up with the, the uh, representation of the warehouse, the um, all the uh, machinery um, that was used in the data, and then all of the process flows or relationships between them. So basically we came up with our own flow chart um, with uh, a fl flow chart um, of the warehouse. And so we talk about uh, the digital twins of, of supply chains. And so basically we came up with a digital twin of the warehouse just from the data, not from uh, from the uh, the uh, through accessing the warehouse itself or either by going to the warehouse or doing, talking to people to to the warehouse. So again, why is this useful? Uh, first, as a uh, supply chain provider, our partner wanted to be able to obtain this information from the data and not necessarily requesting it from the customer. The data is theirs because they're uh, operating the machines. Um, and then second, it enables us to um, identify uh, inefficiencies and areas of improvement. And so the next step is going to be uh, just that. I'm going to uh, talk specifically about one operation and how we identify the, um, the inefficiencies and then how we deal with them using machine learning and optimization tools. Um, and then I'll show you another couple of um, impact stories that um, came out of this uh, project. Um, so um, the graph just shows the um, uh, average and statistics on the um, time it takes uh, the different uh, processes in, in the warehouse. So from receiving an order, and that's the batch received, up to order packed, that's the point where the order of a customer is put in a box and uh, sent to, uh, to shipment. Um, and um, as expected, we know this from the um, um, warehousing industry, we know this from the literature that the picking time is the one that's most consuming. And picking is basically um, the um, collection of the SKUs or items in the order from the shelves of the storage area into what's called a tote, a box, a plastic box, basically. And then that goes uh, then to um, the last part, which could be consolidation if the items of the order are not picked together. And this is um, even with uh, highly automated um, uh, systems, picking systems, there is still uh, quite um, human intensive. So you need lots of, uh, of labor force there. And because of the huge size of the warehouses and the huge um, assortment, it takes a lot of time, just either through a conveyors or by someone, a picker going around the warehouse, it takes a huge amount of time. So as we see here, it's about 80% of the time spent in picking. Um, so then we started by, let's see, how can we improve um, picking? What's the operation that's used here? What type of um, how does picking happen and then how do we improve it? Um, so in this case, we found that the um, picking times are highly random and the main reasons are congestion and human factors. So error, uh, people not following the routes that, are, that they are told to do, there is lots of error. And so it makes when your um, operation is so random and so volatile and it's not under control, then it makes it much harder to come up with um, improved solutions. And so um, the, um, we, what the proposal we came up with is to use machine learning tools to predict 
the impact of batching on the picking times. Uh, so batching is basically grouping a set of orders so that they can be picked together, and that's a batch. Um, and then using robust optimization uh, to optimize the batching and uh, sequentially minimizing picking times. And um, robust optimization um, makes, takes, integrates, if you want, predictions and optimization to come up with robust solutions. So the tool that we, we, we built here is that um, from the data, of the system, from the real data, uh, we built prediction models. Um, so machine learning, all kinds of machine learning models, and then you uh, build, uh, calculate statistics on the validity of these models, and then you pick the best ones. Um, so that's, we tried many of them and then comparisons, and we came up with the one that best predicts the, this operation, given that it's very, it's, uh, it's uh, highly random and, and um, with lots of um, um, outliers, if you want. So once we have the model, then we integrate the um, optimization and the prediction uh, in one iterative process where the optimization forms uh, the batches. And then um, that goes as input into the prediction modeling where we uh, predict the times and the confidence intervals and then feed it back into the optimization. And uh, so this whole loop where you optimize over confidence intervals or you optimize over uncertain data um, over uh, some uncertainty set, if you want, or with some uncertainty is called robust optimization. Um, and then so the output of a robust optimization is just a solution, which again, we can simulate uh, or just evaluate statistically um, and that the evaluation again could use the, re the real data. Um, so what's the impact of, of um, coming up with these complex uh, solutions? Um, they're complex in terms of the engine because there is model building which requires some expertise and there is optimization which also requires another expertise. But as a whole, once it's built, then it's quite easy to, um, to use because you just input data and get uh, batches. That's it. As a user, it's not too complex to use and it does not really disrupt the, the operation at all. Um, so out of um, this uh, type of uh, analysis and then uh, problem, uh, problem solving, um, the, we were able to accurately predict um, such a complex system. Uh, to, uh, we were able to provide robust solutions, which will enable smoother operation and decreased picking times, decreased congestion through the system. Um, and um, I guess the most, uh, for me, the most uh, exciting th thing here is uh, how we were able to digitize the warehouse without accessing uh, the warehouse right from the data. Um, yes, I mean, applying uh, prediction models and robust optimization is also very exciting, uh, but that's something that we do repeatedly. Uh, this is the first time that we were able to reproduce an operation just from the data. So that was uh, something that uh, we're proud of. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a couple more um, uh, impa impactful um, solutions that we came up with uh, in this project, uh, but very briefly this time. Um, so the other one is on optimizing order consolidation. So basically a wave is, uh, let's say, uh, a huge number of orders, let's say 300 orders that are all grouped together and processed through the warehouse together like a wave. So it goes through the warehouse like a wave. And then, uh, so it's picked, they're picked all together, mixed, and then they go into a buffer to wait. Once they're all picked, all the orders in the wave are picked, then you have to uh, kind of reconsolidate the orders. So group the items for, for the same order from the, different, uh, from the different places in the wave and put them uh, together in a package to, uh, to send them to the customer. And um, we, uh, in, 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 uh, by analyzing the data, we found that um, the, the, this, um, there is a huge weight of the wave in the buffer and it takes a huge amount of, amounts of time that we can improve by adding a small piece, which is the sequencing. If we optimize the sequencing in which we consolidate the orders, then we can make, make huge savings. And so the sequencing piece itself, that's uh, an optimization. It's, uh, it's the, the thing behind it is an optimization um, 
a tool that uh, solves uh, a new uh, version of a machine scheduling problem. Um, it's um, so that's that's a good thing out of this too. The, even we had we introduced a new problem to the literature in machine scheduling, um, and so um, the output of this is that through simulated analysis we were able to show that um, we can decrease the order completion time itself by 30 percent, and that's significant. That's huge savings. Um, and that 75% of the orders would uh, have improved completion time. So we at least three quarters of the orders would um, reach the end point in, in shorter times. And also uh, cub usage, this is the place where they put the packaged orders. Um, it's a resource that's uh, heavily used and sometimes the delay is because the cubby is full used. So we were able through this to also decrease the usage of the cubby by 20%, which means we can do 20% more at the same time. Uh, Harold, uh, do I have time or do you want me to stop? Uh, we have about four minutes left. Um, okay, uh, if, you're, if you'd like to go, I'd like to ask a question or two also. Yeah, okay, so yes, uh, I, I think I... So is that, that five minutes including the Q&A? Yeah, we've got another four minutes left. That's total. Oh, okay. Okay. So then I will skip the other one. And I guess you can see the flow chart there. It looks fancy, but I skip it. And then I'll go to the um, conclusion. Um, so again, the approach we take is what we call data analytics approach. Um, it's data driven. Um, and um, the purpose is to uh, come up with decision making that is data driven. Uh, we use uh, AI and ML uh, tools to predict uh, system parameters, and then we use optimization and simulation to, to prescribe um, uh, operations, how to, how to do things, how to improve things, and so on. And um, through this approach, in addition to what I just presented, we have other successful industry collaborations uh, on uh, warehousing, on stock management, on capacity planning, um, so huge potential for data analytics in all aspects of supply chain. Uh, the, 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 the process is, is almost the same. The tools depend on the application itself. Um, and, and yeah, so that's, uh, that's it for me, uh, Harold. Okay. I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah, so I have uh, one question here for you. So assume a company has a gut feeling they should start bringing AI to their supply chain management. Mm -hmm. Do they, would they have to understand their inefficiencies or just let the AI come back, analyze the data and make recommendations? I guess if they already know where the inefficiencies are, then it's not data driven anymore. You're just using the data to solve the problems, but it's not from the data. Right, and but so, it could be could be gut feeling of what they yeah. think is inefficient. That's the problem, you know. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, there's no perfect operation, so there is always uh, uh, a, an opportunity for improvement. But I mean, if you know the specific problem, if you come to say, okay, I want to solve this specific problem, then yes, you can apply AI and uh, and optimization to solve your problem. But that's not data driven. It's driven by your experience and by your knowledge of your system. It's data driven when you uh, you, you let the data tell you what to do. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay. And you know, previous uh, presenter talked about the supply chain being manufacturing, then distribution, and consumption. This sounds like most of your talk has been focused on internal distribution, just within the factory. Exactly. Yes. So it's it's within the uh, the warehouse, but the same analysis could apply if you have a production facility, and the same analysis could apply for the supply chain as a whole, because then your entities or your nodes become your uh, different facilities, production facilities, warehousing facilities. Uh, retail facilities and so on and then the flows represent the uh, amount of flows between those like for example either tracks of uh, unfinished product or, or tracks of finished product to the consumer or raw material could be also information flows but the okay. good thing about uh, uh, network representation is it's it's so open and you can represent so many systems with the same logic by just uh, changing the definition of what's a node and what's an arc Okay, on your first example, you showed 10,000 orders a day. I'll put the same question to you I asked Samir. Is that big data in your mind? Is that mid-sized data or is that an irrelevant question? Uh, it's, uh, 
I, I would say it's the data is not huge. It's a lot. It's a lot meaning that the operator cannot figure themselves, uh, can f cannot figure by themselves. They cannot really just figure out what's uh, what's going on in their process if they're, they're, they're processing that many during a day. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's uh, it's complex. OK, so it's not the number of data entries, but it's the complexity of the interaction between the data entries. So the complexity of the system itself. If you have a simple system with two machines, then even if you have tons and tons of data, it's just two machines. But when you have, you know, many machines that interact in different ways, then it becomes difficult for the human brain to process. And that's right. when we need more sophisticated tools. OK, well, that's uh, we're out of time now, so that's, uh, you know, just after 2.15. I thank you again so much for your presentation today. It was very informative. And if there's more questions that people can follow up on my email, it'd be at the end and I'll forward them back to you. Thanks again. Oh, I think thank we, uh, um, yes. Yeah, so uh, next we're going to have um, uh, two speakers presenting <clears throat> and I'll just do a quick introduction on both of them. Um, we're, they're going to be, the topic is supply chain analytics for improved decisions. Our first uh, of, of the two speakers is uh, Meridad and Meridad uh, Pernina, Perninia. Um, he's going to hit me afterwards because I screwed up his name. But um, so uh, Meridad is an experienced researcher and educator with a demonstrated history of working in higher uh, education and industry. He is skilled in applying optimization and data-driven techniques in energy systems to provide reliable, clean, and affordable energy. Meridad works extensively in the field of power flow within power grids, using our, um, algorithmic systems. He determines the optimal allocation of power throughout a grid to maximize value per cost, as well as promote social equity through electrical power distribution. His work has earned him an NSERC funding on three separate occasions within the last two years. Co-presenting with uh, Merida today will be Dr. Kurash Malik. He is currently a, uh, a division head in AI and data analytics. And if you think uh, Dr. Malik's gonna be mad at me because I'll screw up this one too. Uh, for Chung Syndrome, uh, Ulich in, uh, in Germany, with a primary focus, and that's the name of uh, a research institute from Germany, with a primary focus on practical data models and analytics at the interface of, interface of IoT, AI, and big data. His current research is focused on development, deployment of scalable AI-driven and AI-powered algorithms. Prior to, to, to joining his organization, he has been a, a program technical lead and senior research officer at NRC, and an adjunct professor at SFU. He holds PhD and MBA specializing in management of technology. Please join me today in welcoming uh, Meridad and, and Kurash for their presentation on machine learning for fresh produce and, and analytics. Sure. So um, I'm able to share my, my slides. Uh, Meridad, do you want to go first? Sure. I'll just give a minute for his slides to be brought up. So are you able to see the screen? Yes. Perfect. So yeah, the topic of the talk I have uh, today is ML-based algorithms for fresh produce logistics. Um, and um, as Harold mentioned, my name is Mirta Lassen Pirnia from the Department of the Management Sciences, University of Waterloo. So I think this talk would be a great continuation to what uh, Samir and Fatma went over. Samir uh, described a sort of holistic point of view of data analytics and machine learning for logistics. And uh, Fatma gave an example of a case that they have lots of data for. And um, here I'm going to start off with um, a project, a case uh, that we are working on, and a vision that we have that we are looking for more data to develop. So for this project, we just started by um, some fake data at this point and we are hoping to uh, make the data more realistic. 
Well, uh, this work is in collaboration with uh, Amir Lutfi, my uh, master's student from Management Sciences Department. Um, he has a background in EC as well, and um, most of the credit for this work goes to him, of course. And uh, the other collaborators are from NRC, um, Chiampu Wang, uh, who is a team leader uh, at National uh, Research Council Canada, and then Kurosh Malik, the division head in AI and data analytics at uh, Hulich, Germany. So just uh, giving you a um, quick view of um, what Fresh Produce uh, is and then uh, the real-time uh, traceability of the product. Uh, well, this project uh, shaped from this collaboration with NRC and U Waterloo, and it is defined to utilize machine learning to ensure product freshness uh, after tracking the conditions and uh, monitoring of all the operational elements along the logistics of the fresh products. And um, the, the proposed work is based on IoT-based framework, and we're using the generated data to predict the shelf life of the produce at the time of delivery. And also, uh, going back to prescriptive analytics that um, uh, Dr. Al-Hedley mentioned, we're going to prescribe the required conditions at each stage of the delivery of the product so that we are going to reach a certain level of conditions that we are desiring. So based on this, the outline of the work that I'm going to have today would be as follow. Uh, first, um, I'm gonna talk a bit more about this uh, collaboration with NRC, and uh, we will talk about the expected outcomes from this project. And then uh, we will look at the vision that we have, uh, the um, search uh, that we've had so far and the literature and um, the required characteristics uh, of the data that we need. And then um, I'll go over the work that we've done in the past few months on this with uh, generating the data set and also our approach for uh, predicting the quality and shelf life of the products and also um, I wrap up with some discussions and future work and the potentials uh, that we have for working with industry partners. So uh, the background, just a quick background on uh, what we mean by fresh goods supply chain. It's basically linking the producers to distribution centers, stores, and other demand points. Uh, we all know about the you know supply chain here uh, based on the uh, presentation that uh, Samir gave. And now just, um, you know, the flowing part as an item here would be the fresh uh, goods. And these fresh goods can be anything that can be uh, deteriorating throughout the uh, supply chain. You know, it can be from fruits and vegetables to meat and um, even pharmaceuticals, uh, um, pharmaceuticals as, uh, as well. Um, and based on this project, we want to um, estimate the shelf life on a certain conditions uh, that uh, the products go through. Uh, and these conditions are basically the environmental conditions that the uh, producer are going through. And um, one of the goal is the goals of the producers and distribution throughout this system is maximizing their profit margins by improving products shelf life, while they're also minimizing the cost by controlling the environmental conditions so that they achieve the level they want to achieve, basically. So um, the expected outcomes of the uh, project of this collaboration with NRC are four things. Basically, the first thing is we want to design a data workflow, and uh, that includes the types of sensors that we are going to use and their placement for an IoT-based frameworks throughout the supply chain. And then we want to come up with a framework for data collection, basically, and um, you know, collecting the data and categorizing baseline training data is very important here. Um, so we want to see what would be the features of the data which are more important. And um, these features could be anything from environmental characteristics to operational variables, which are going to impact the quality of the products throughout the supply chain. And then um, we are planning to develop uh, freshness ML based models. So these models are basically uh, 
predict if they're predicting the quality of the product or the quality score of the products by the time they're reaching the retailers. And also they're going to be prescriptive in a sense that they're going to prescribe the conditions that you have to put your product at so that when it comes to the hand of consu uh, consumers, they are going to hold on to certain qualities. And then uh, finally, we want to um, use the output from the ML models to design end-to-end -end supply chain networks. And uh, basically, we are going to use optimization models to develop uh, and uh, to, to decide uh, where to put the sensors, the locations, and the number of the sensors needed for the data collection. And also, the output of the machine learning models will be used uh, in the optimization models to uh, make them more efficient. And also, uh, we're going to develop different scenarios in order to um, somehow being able to um, give robust solutions to consumers. So after reviewing some literature, these are the products that we've seen in the literature they are working on. They are working on um, you know, different types of vegetables, bread, olive oils, and so on. But the rigor that we've seen in the uh, literature is not as we are expecting. So the whole area is pretty new and there are not a wide variety of products uh, being worked on yet. And uh, one of the other challenges that we have is the data that uh, these uh, papers have worked on, they're not available. And uh, we are hoping to, um, you know, we were hoping to find some available data, but it hasn't been possible yet. So uh, looking at the literature again, we realized that the temperature is playing a significant role in the health of the product. And uh, basically, if you are looking at this uh, graph on the right side, you see that if we are uh, holding the products at lower temperatures, um, you know, the lines which is showing the two degrees shows the product will have a longer storage time. You know, they, they all start from, uh, if you're looking at the vertical axis, that would be the score, the quality score or the acceptance level of the product. And then the, uh, x-axis or the, the horizontal axis would be the storage time or the days that uh, we are going to keep the product. So for a degree of two, the data shows that we are going to have, um, you know, to have the product for 30 days. But when you are keeping the product at 20 degrees, for example, as it's shown, you see you have the product for a few days and then the quality level drops significantly. So now the challenge is, for different types of products, what should be the optimal temperature? And these temperature, we know that there is a cost associated with lower temperatures. So we want to find something which would be acceptable for both um, consumers and also producers. And then uh, there might be some ways to play with the temperatures throughout the supply chain so that a different stage of the product delivery from the from harvesting the product to the time they get into the hands of cons uh, consumers, uh, we can just uh, have different types of temperatures at different routes and different uh, places so that we are minimizing the cost as well. So that's been one of the most important features that uh, we've observed in the data. And then the other features that uh, that have been studied on, uh, we have um, we have the chemical byproducts, for example, ethylene, uh, uh, tetra table acidity, free fatty acids, um, tyrosine, peroxide value, and vitamin C. These are the other features that are somehow uh, important in order to uh, be considered as contributors to the health of the product as well. And then we have other features like the physical look uh, or uh, you know how the fruit or the vegetable is losing weight and also the firmness of them. So the data set that we are creating, we've been able to create so far using uh, regression methods and some data that we've had available in the past and mapping the data to the temperature and um, uh, time zones 
are somehow like this. So we are looking at two basic features, temperature and weight here, and then we are allocating a quality score to that. And these are also mapped to the time of the uh, time timelines as well. So um, this is this is something that we had some data available. We again did some sort of mapping. This is not exactly uh, showing the you know the true characteristics of the products, but this is something to start working on. This is one of the data sets that we came up with, and the other data set is based on the images. Uh, we found some videos on online and then these videos basically are time lapse of uh, different types of products here i'm showing watermelons and uh, bananas here and as you see throughout the time um we they are going to change their um shape and colors and everything so based on that we are able to see how um to see how the quality deteriorates and then if we have the um, temperature and other characteristics of the environment, we can map them to those uh, characteristics. And then uh, based on the timelines, we can have a good prediction model of how the products are deteriorating in different uh, temperatures. So based on uh, what I showed you, based on the uh, image, images that we've had, we uh, came up with some classification. That's a preliminary work that we've done so far. So uh, the product that we looked at, uh, I believe this one is the lettuce. Uh, and then uh, we reduced the uh, resolution from 1920, uh, 1080 to 192 by 108. And then we use the convolutional neural network uh, as an algorithm to be able to predict the score, the quality score of these products based on uh, their shape. And then the number of classes that we have are five. And uh, these are some uh, other information that we use to tune the neural network model that we use. Uh, one important aspect here is uh, we split the data uh, by 80, 20, 80 for 72 for training, validation 8%, and then 20% for test. That's the common practice. And then uh, the validation accuracy uh, came up to be 90% 90 and the test accuracy was 81%, which are pretty good estimation of the, of the uh, quality of the model that we use and we developed here. So, but now the question is how we can operationalize this uh, machine learning method. What would be the use cases for industries here? So, um, as I showed, as uh, I explained in the previous slide, Im image classification is used for generating the data sets. And uh, so far, we've we mapped the quality score to the uh, shape of the um, product, but we can map that to temperature and weight loss as well. And also, we can have an understanding of the mapping uh, of the previous state to the current state as well, as we are looking at the time series model. So, and then um, these ML models can be tuned for different products. So this was one of the products that I showed you, but uh, we can map them to different types of products based on different environmental conditions. And, uh, you know, any sort of uh, machine learning method can be used. The, uh, the ones that we found would be very useful would be recursive neural networks and uh, LSTM because we're using time series model here. And then uh, we're using ML model uh, prescribing what conditions the product should be at to achieve the desired level of quality. Basically, this is some sort of uh, a prescription that uh, the model will be giving us. So um, after the training the data based on the images, we can have a very robust model so that we can uh, you know, just um, have the quality that is desired as an input to the model and then find out what should be the characteristic of the environment so that we get into uh, the level that we are desiring for. And also in order to collect the data and make sure the environmental conditions are consistent across the supply chain, we are using the IoT based uh, sensors at different stages of uh, the supply chain. But uh, the main thing that our um, that I'm here to discuss here is basically the one of the most important thing is the data collection. 
that's the part that uh, we've had issues with. If we uh, had better data or um, collaboration with um, industries, we could have um, done a much uh, more accurate job, of course, and we are hoping to achieve that pretty soon as that, that is one of the outcomes of this uh, project to be able to implement this uh, with realistic data sets. So, um, yeah, we determined the quality of scores. The scores have been from zero to five, but these scores are what type of standards we should have in order to uh, justify the quality of the scores, because, uh, you know, they might be a little bit subjective, but what, uh, what are the things that we should consider so that we reduce the subjectivity of our judgment when it comes to the quality? Uh, whether it is the appearance, the color, the compactness, flavor, or the overall quality of the product. And then, um, well, this is an image processing type of model uh, that we are using to create the models in the beginning. So we reduced the images at first, but if we had uh, high resolution um, images, the quality would have been much better than 80%, of course. So now the question is, um, you know, how much computational power we can get, we can achieve uh, within the supply chain industries, basically. And then the type of sensors, there are different types of sensors available. And uh, uh, one thing that uh, industries should be thinking of is uh, what type of uh, sensors we have to consider and where to place these sensors, basically, from, uh, you know, whether we, we should uh, find the um, features or the information on the product or on the whole package or on the truck or on the pallet. Basically, which conditions are the most important ones at what place in the truck or so, so that we are going to collect those information. And then the storage and retrieve all of the data, the infrastructure that we need to use for uh, tracking the products. These are all um, having very high importance in this research. And also the possibility to group products with similar features. For example, whether um, we can study the data to see whether apples and oranges can be combined together and use the same model, basically. So uh, yeah, the future works are we're going to uh, improve the prediction models. And um, but before improving any sort of prediction models or prescription models, what we need is uh, finding the industry partners. And I hope one of the outcomes of this uh, talk today would be industries reaching out to us to, uh, you know, uh, so that we can uh, help them with this research. Um, just uh, to give you an idea, the research has been already funded, so we just need some in-kind contributions from the industries and, uh, you know, basically um, them letting us to use their facilities for this research and helping them. Um, this is my email address and thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Meridad. So what we're going to ask right now is people could save their questions. We're going to go on to Dr. Malik and get him to present and then we'll bring questions at the end. Okay. Okay, so let's transition over to uh, Dr. Malik's slides. Okay, well, thank you again. And sorry for the glitch. Uh, always switching from Zoom to, to Teams is difficult, at least on my end. Uh, thanks for the invitation and thanks, Murdoch, for, for giving introduction to, to the project we're doing together. So I'm from uh, Julish uh, Research Center, just make it easy without any German pronunciation. It's called the Forsuns Centrum Julish. It's located in Julish, uh, uh, somewhere in the, in the south, uh, southwest of, of Germany. Uh, a bit about what we do there. Um, I'm, I'm part of the uh, the, uh, the group that is, is mainly focused on the energy applying of the AI and, and analytics into energy as part of as part of Eulish um, uh, sort of infrastructure. We're looking at the problems at the interface of information technologies, uh, 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 social issues and energy. Then as part of the Helmuts, which is our parent organizations um, involved in, in Helmuts AI, which is a, which is applying AI in in, in in different areas, including supply chain, including including biomedical, climate change, and so on. So the research uh, areas that we do in in this in this context is is generally um, on an integrated, uh, multidisciplinary approaches, models that we apply to different uh, problems when similarities are there. So let me just talk about the the specific system on supply chain that we're interested in. Uh, 
despite a lot of talks that 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 are in in sort of long haul uh, supply chains, uh, long haul uh, sort of delivery and and logistics, the urban delivery and and sort of local deliveries and the local supply chain is a different the type of um, environment and infrastructure when it comes to data availability of the data as well as the fast paced environment uh, of 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 getting products uh, from the uh, sort of production side into processing and distribution warehousing all the all, all the requirements of the of the retail and consumer delivery up to the sort of last mile so if you look at this sort of fast pace you're dealing with the problem of a uh, few problems uh, first would be the visibility of the of the of the supply chain and the logistic to the end user. So key parts of the on demand supply chain logistics and distribution are obviously not visible to the end users uh, due to the fast pace and, and sort of short time of, of of the production to end user delivery. Um, the the uh, certain environmental aspects are, are recorded generally and not really a freshness or effect, um, effectiveness of the product. So basically uh, certain Metadata is, is gathered, not analyzed on a daily basis because the, these are not generally used for sort of evaluating of the freshness on, a, on an ongoing basis. There is a there's a massive amount of siloed the data assets, and it's always difficult to make sense of all this. Obviously, on uh, 18 to 20 types of data points at different location every every 10 minutes to you know 30 minutes, so it's a huge amount of data that is gathered. But is not is, is is not utilized enough. And finally, uh, uh, due to the sort of manual record keeping of leading uh, with a lack of traceability along the supply chain in this uh, sort of a, sort of fast paced on demand supply chain in urban areas, uh, during the outbreak or or sort of irregularities, you probably have about two three weeks to find these irregularities, which by by that time the product is already out of the supply chain. So really, that's not. As effective as should be. So, what uh, problem that we are bringing in can be solved is that the low shelf life, due to sort of a lack of traceability, by applying a certain amount of the of the data acquisition and the IoT technology, is able to basically uh, remove the manual work out of the out of the sort of operation and bring the operation costs as industry usually want to get about one third of the of the cost existing. Uh, multiple uh, time in terms of, of data discovery, and that's where AI can actually help a lot in, in that sense. And vulnerability detection has to happen in hours because of this fast paced uh, environment that we're dealing with. So uh, the freshness tracking and sort of verification, a very simple way if I'm going to put it, it's basically uh, you need the type of self-learning algorithms that they can be powered by sort of data acquisition to AI, uh, AI as well as IoT technologies. Yeah, you can basically identify the asset types. So as, as we recall it to sort of regulated goods that needs a certain amount of the, of the visibility into the, in, into the environment that they have been. As well as the sort of uh, the sort of logistic side of it, security, record keeping, and all that that applies to uh, to fresh fruit to some degree due to sort of sort of outbreaks that can happen. They can happen as a result of the bacteria and, and so on. Drug and pharmaceutics usually on, are in that categories, and then, and then we have sort of other uh, regulated goods as well. Uh, the other type of information is the operations, right? The location. The number of orders, the time of orders, uh, the intervals uh, between orders, logistic itself, and, and also record keeping as a set. The environment, it could be temperature, humidity, sort of pressure, mechanical shocks, and all that that is also, also traceable to uh, the IoT technology. And then we have time and quality features that merely talk a little bit about it. it the requirement of assessing these self-learning algorithms to be able to uh, to gather all this information and come up with some form of freshness is basically uh, good quality training data assets that unfortunately is not available widely as it should be and the, and the result of the uh, of, uh, of the lack of this data would 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 go to some form of sort of standardization uh, it talks that is going on i mean there are some uh, some uh, sort of association based uh, uh, activities through IBM like food trust and the trade lens for the for the long haul delivery and and the logistics. But 
the reality is that the metadata quality as it as it gathered from different sources is not in the level to be able to support this self-learning algorithm. So that's that's really the problem on the data side we deal with. So in addition to that, also it's the uh, the architecture of the software and hardware is used. Um, so on the data side, we're looking at the at the objective to get fast vulnerability sort of detection and 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 faster discovery to recall uh, sort of process. So basically, you have the asset data, inventory data, orders, uh, sensor data, and operational data, and then you do have uh, uh, a software that has to be sort of layered in in terms of the AI and analytics uh, attached to the, the enterprise uh, resource planning the solutions such as CRM, such as all other sort of accounting and ordering, scheduling, and then you have also the, um, the, the, the IoT management. Uh, so these are basically the so a fully modular software really is required uh, to be sort of sort of agnostic to the device, be able to track the sort of at the item level as well as this so the delivery level, be able to look at some environmental aspects to be able to look at the barcode, the schedule. So it's a very complex environment that we have to deal with if you want to get all this information in one place. And, and one of the reasons that basically a lot of this, this data is not available. So in terms of the hardware, what I want to emphasize is that if you look at the sort of price per unit uh, versus the, um, the uh, sort of a, feature technology in terms of the sensor, you're looking at sort of paper based. I mean, that's obviously one of the cheapest way of, of gathering a lot of this information. And then if you move and sort of along that line to analog uh, based on chemical sensors, and then you have digital sensors for the tracking of the vehicle, all the sort of providers. And then you go into the expensive parts of the, of the ecosystem that are looking at the cellular and you add batteries so they it can run up to up to thousands of hours without the uh, need to be sort of connected. And then at the end, you see printable electronics, one of the sort of uh, the areas that has been sort of emerging in the past year. And and that's a sweet spot really in terms of the IoT technology when it comes to item based uh, tracking. And that's what we're we're going to talk a little bit about that. So uh, a few of the of the sensors that we know and we have worked with so Asinosis has been a spin-off from my institution in Germany, and then we have tax sensors in Norway that we have been using. So uh, just give you an idea of the of the user case for gathering of the metadata. So you're looking at 25, up to 25 beans per day per vehicle. You're looking at about 20 minutes per stop with the 20 minutes time interval between each stops, and then you're sort of recording temperature, mainly humidity, every five to 10 seconds. You can go lower than five. You can do every two minutes. It's not really required, but after one hour also is not is not as 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 practical because of the fast uh, sort of uh, low shelf life of a lot of this is this um, these products. The order management and scheduling, of course, is another type of, sort of metadata that is required in terms of the uh, time of delivery, the supplier, the sort of producer. And 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 that's why the existing of a CRM is very important in this in this case, uh, which is able to basically track or assign each order to to the supply and the type of products. And you have the sort of information of driver, time of delivery, and location. Uh, some of the routing could be consistent depending on the type of of the delivery, or, or should be random. The route optimization is 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 sort of well established in the industry, and I, I don't want to talk about it, but. Uh, it, it, but another element of, of the route, route optimization, in addition to the fuel uh, sort of saving and, and best and shorter route, is basically the multi temperature requirements of the product. Some product has to be sort of delivered in the morning and, and has, to, has to be sort of within a specific time frame for the delivery, and some other products can be done at the end. So that's also impact the way the route optimization is done. So practically, the way we have we have done it on some sort of pilot projects. We have looked at our own uh, sort of order management system that we have built. Uh, we work with some partners. We put sort of all information in terms of supplier, the end user uh, name of the, of course, the sort of uh, the end user product ID, a depot that the, uh, the product has been taken from, the initial conditions, temperature and humidity, name of driver, all this information has 
so the metadata is gathered. It would put in a QR code, and then we we sort of print that on the on the tag sensor that we had access to. So basically, each order is assigned to one tag. Multiple orders can also be assigned into into one tag, depending on the QR that has to be sort of adjusted, depending on the on the requirements of the order. So once it's done, the next step is basically at the driver side that that can scan the uh, the serial shipping or the or the barcode or just uh, scan our, our QR with the mobile app and then uh, they upload basically a tag content that includes the temperature in certain sort of intervals and all the information that has been sort of gathering it during the order. It push into API and then at the end of sort of the at the end user sort of delivery, all this information would be sort of captured as as the picture of the product and put into our our system. So what we have is basically number of orders, uh, devices that are connected is it could be sort of vehicle based and also item based. We both are attaching to the same same databases in in each order. And uh, typical results that you can see in terms of the data, all the temperature data, for example, that you see at different intervals is assigned to each order. So once you have the information of one order, you're able to look at all sort of metadata up to 18 to 20 data points that you can see all the information attached to that order. And that's where we are creating our, our high quality sort of metadata for the for the training purposes. So what Merla talked about that is basically where we are at at this point. Uh, the operational data that we're gathering is not enough, but is it has sort of quality that is required for the classification work that Merla just to talk about it. Of course, we have some of our algorithms and model of the image analysis that we have developed and applied to a lot of different applications would be used for this project once the sort of clarification uh, in the data and also quality sort of classifications that we are defining with the specific product is known. We can test them on some some convolutional sort of neural network. So that's a that's a project that we are we're working together on that end, and we're hoping that we are able to basically have sort of more practical view of how this uh, this sort of freshness can can be defined and followed in a practical uh, uh, sort of infrastructure. And thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to answer answer your question. Okay, so we've uh, we've only we're kind of pressed for time right now, but I I would like to ask a question to both uh, Mayor Dad and uh, Dr. Melik. If you're looking for more partners, is it a company? Is it a consortium uh, from one end of the supply chain? Who, what's the takeaway? Who comes knocking on your door and says, I've got data? Is it a fresh, is it the producer? Who, who yeah. is best, who's best to be your partners here? Do you want me to go, Merda, or you want to? Uh, answer? Go ahead, okay, so basically, uh, so as I mentioned, the existing data in the industry right now is not as, the at least for the purpose of what we are doing is not this the quality that we're looking at but you you mentioned few of the of the data vendors right like the sort of producers uh, deliveries you know all the all the sort of fast based on demand sort of deliveries the only thing is that the uh, this data is not gathered on a day to day basis and the quality because it's not a problem on a day to day basis unless uh, until it becomes a problem, and that's that. Basically, the implementation happens at that level. So, generally speaking, I think consortia and sort of um, industry associations are the best uh, spot for this because obviously this training data has been sort of democratized. It can be used for different product as much as possible, and that would be the main the main basis for the infrastructure of the data. But working with the companies as as part of so I mentioned IBM. Uh, sort of food trust, that's a similar sort of infrastructure that, that they have developed. Uh, that's not by, um, it's not a sort of real time data, it's by sort of entry of data, it's not the same sort of sort of level of information we're talking here. I hope I was able to answer that. Okay. Uh, and and if about? I want to add to this a little bit, um, I think it would be very important to see how the items are traveling through the supply chain. Basically, uh, you know, from harvesting to the time that they're getting into the hands of uh, consumers so that we see exactly what would be the expectation. And because uh, throughout the supply chain, the products are going through different stages as well. 
and it would be really nice that we can get some information on when and where, uh, like, yeah, when to harvest the products. And then, uh, you know, again, going back to that uh, question that uh, I raised first, what would be the different temperatures or the conditions that we should keep the product at at different stages of the supply chain, basically? Okay. Okay. Well, thanks uh, to both of you for your presentations today. And uh, again, any partners who can reach out, if there's any connectivity, I'll get those links back to yourselves. So again, thanks to uh, both uh, Dr. Malik and, and Meridad for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so we're, we're a little uh, flexible with our schedule right now. I just want to uh, right now give a little blurb on where we're at with Waterloo AI and some of the new initiatives we're, we're going to be uh, we're underway in developing. Samir touched on it initially about training. What we recognize is there's partners in different phases of their journey. Uh, I call it the crawl, walk, run, fly, you know, where they are in their process. What's consistent across all three processes or all three or, you know, four stepping levels there is training and upskilling and education and Samir talked about it being a data culture and, and DB from Nutrien is going to touch on that in a minute. So we're looking at uh, really taking that and making uh, both basic level courses that can be broadly across all industries. And so I'll think of this as basic and bespoke, something more focused for specific verticals. And again, I'll put that out there as an opportunity if there's any interest for either of those more basic training, how our delivery and rollout mechanism will be through Wattspeed, which is our virtual training opportunity. We're also gonna be working with um, Samir himself to look at is there possibilities <clears throat> to bring his customized training for supply. Oh, excuse me for a second. Customized training for uh, supply chain and bring that into uh, a more basic or bespoke levels that can be brought for companies. So these are some opportunities that we're looking to bring more values to our partners um, and to anyone who wants to participate in those training. So again, please reach out to me. Contact information will be at the end. Um, that's the lead in I wanted to give you. I mean, what is, uh, you know, Waterloo AI is working with partners who adjust their needs. We, we work with it. What is uh, we look at as being a, a poll model. We're pulling your needs, your uh, your applications, and applying our AI and and help towards solving your problems. So a perfect example of that is uh, is going to be our next speaker, which is from Nutrien, and uh, and that's uh, uh, short form. He he calls himself DB. His long name is Debasis uh, uh, Malik. So who is DB? So so DB is currently the VP of Information and Digital Solutions at Nutrien. He's responsible for enterprise applications and data. So he is uh, has also had former senior roles with uh, global Fortune 100 companies like IBM, Siemens Medical, CGI, and Enbridge. Uh, I found out today for the first time that DB is an author, an author of Leadership 4.0. It's an Amazon bestseller. Um, he's a part-time instructor at, at Mount Royal University of Continuing Education, and he serves on the board of United Way Calgary, McMahon Youth and Canadian Mental Health Association. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, Let's Talk Science and a member of Innovation Leadership for Calgary Economic Development. So without further delay, over to you, DB, and uh, thanks for joining us today as your key our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Harold. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you OK, and I can see the presentation. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me here. And uh, I'm going to say at the beginning, I still struggle with presenting to a computer instead of to real human beings. So I'll try to do my best. So I originally joined the call. I intended to join the call at about five minutes to my time, but I joined a little early to test the audio and all that kind of thing. And I really got stuck and submit your presentation and Fatma and then Mehdad and Dr. Malik, really, really learning experience for me uh, to begin with. With that, if you go to the next slide, please, Nicola. So I'll start with a little bit of an overview of Nutria and the company I work for and the company I was part of when it was born, which is a rare opportunity you get 
in your lifetime in a career where you are part of a company when it is born unless it is a startup. So in these examples, so I will start with the purpose, why this company and how we what we think about our purposes and what we believe our purpose is is growing our world from the ground up. So we are in the business of agriculture and agriculture input uh, products and services and a whole uh, nine years. We will talk about that in a little bit. And the biggest part of that is to feeding the future, which is about we'll have a lot more people on the same earth in the next few years. How do we create the productivity of farmers and our growers and we can feed everybody effectively? That's our purpose. We have two core values, which is safety and integrity. If you want to remember two things about us, that's those are the two we really live and breathe by that. We will talk about some of our business lines. A lot of those has a lot of uh, chances of being unsafe and all that kind of thing or a lot of vulnerabilities. So we take safety as our top priority for everything we do and integrity is how we work. Next slide, please, Nicola. And please feel free to write some questions, whatever you want to ask. And I don't know, I know all the answers, particularly if you ask me what is the size of a big data and less not a big data. I thought that was a very good and interesting question and the answers were awesome. Uh, I don't know those answers, but uh, I can tell you the how we think about big data, which is uh, which is the things which comes like time series data and those non-structured data, everything which comes from a transactional data, we think that they are data, right? So. Anyway, so don't ask me those difficult questions. Just feel free to ask as many questions you want to. So Nutrien at a glance, we are in 13 countries, over 25,000 people, 27 very, very large production facilities, which includes mining, which is one mile under the earth, uh, and then also surface manufacturing like nitrogen and uh, phosphate. And then we have more than 2000 retail locations in North America, Australia, we have quite a few different lines of business in Australia, which I was surprised to learn about as well, which was including water, livestock, etc. So we are we are in quite a few countries. Uh, we are all over the value chain from the from the mining to the silo for all the agricultural needs, and we are the largest vertically integrated crop, crop input and solution companies. We are very proud of that, uh, uh, what we are and. That's a huge supply chain. I will talk to you about that a little bit in a while. That supply chain from under the ground to the farmers is pretty long supply chain and we have very large fleets we will talk about in a while. Nicola, next slide, please. So now moving to the data part of the journey so far, is I, I believe it is all about the people, passion and partner. Why I say that is all started with people trying to figure out what we need to do, how to become a digital organization, and then the passion. There was a whole bunch of people, a small group of people initially, who are really passionate about making data work and data tell the story. I think Samir, or Samir, I think you said that data and statistics usually do not lie. So the people who believe that, whose passion was that, uh, we, we picked on that, and we use a lot of partners. We leverage a lot of partners. You have Waterloo is a partner of ours. We do some uh, quite a few use cases with them, and we are now talking about some training work potentially with UF Waterloo as well. And then we have other partners like Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, etc. You name it, we we are partnered with a lot of other companies. So that's how we work. It's our people, a lot of passion, and a lot of partners. We drive our data journey. Next slide, Nicola, please. So this is really I chart, and the purpose is I'm not expecting everybody to read all the bullets and there is no trivia at the end. Uh, this is a little bit of a journey of the data over last uh, four years almost. And we were born, Nutrien was born on January 1, 2018. For those you don't know, this is a product of a merger of equals between Porash Corp of Saskatchewan and Agrium, who used to be the legacy companies. So it was born on 2018. I was one of the lucky 34 people, uh, 34 leaders, who, who led this merger. So it's a very proud moment for me personally, where Nutrion was born, the name was new, the culture definition was new, the purpose was new, the logo was new. It was a lot of new thing, almost like a very grown, big, large startup was born on a day of January 1, which was pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing experience for me personally and for many others in the company. So the interesting thing which happened with this, merger and the birth of a new company is that all the data assets we have 
we had, their usefulness went down immediately. Think for think about that for a second. Let's say you have basic reporting, some kind of uh, models or whatever. They were representing a portion of the business. So if you are trying to look for a gross margin across a nutrient or a service line from the existing data assets and report or visualization or what what have you, the value is limited now. At least went down by 50% or 100% based on how you calculate because it was not telling the story what the company story was because the company is now different. So unifying and bringing the data assets together was the first priority uh, of the team. Some of the discussions I heard before, I was really glad to hear. It's not about just uh, running with a hammer which AI written on it. It's about getting the data in a way which is useful. Often time, uh, I think somebody mentioned the word Excel, which was very interesting that uh, somebody mentioned that. Who cares? You use whatever tool you use. If you can make it useful, you can monetize it and get the value out of it. That's the most important priority versus we have to have a thing which is called AI. So that was our first priority. How to unify, how to bring the data asset together so that it is still meaningful. We can close our books. We can see our results. We can forecast our data with metrics which we need to, all that kind of a thing. That was as simple as that. If you see, that was our thing. And then as we develop that, we got a good set of data built up, which was very key for good application and use for AI, machine learning, what have you. And I believe that's kind of started with inching on that in 2018, 19 a little bit. But for last couple of years, we are doing it way more deliberately. We believe we have a very good set of data internally as well. We have a lot of good plugins from external sources of data like weather data, like other external published data and all that kind of a thing, which allows us to do a lot more application and smart application of AI, which results in some uh, business value. So that has been our journey and I couldn't quite show this on this slide. The part which I like about this is kind of the similar kind of effort in terms of resource, etc. There is a flow wherein the outcome is becoming more than a linear growth, which I am proud of. For example, if you see in 2020, we did 20 use cases in 2020 and in 2021, we are doing 20 plus 20 plus one game changing. And why say 20 and 20? First 20 is leveraging the patterns of what we already created last year, that 20, two new, 20 new patterns and one, something which is more expansive and which have a long term effect beyond that use case. So that was our goal for 2021. I believe we are on path to do that. And I envision that the growth or the number of use cases or outcomes keep on increasing in that way, hopefully, and someday become close to the, uh, the curve, uh, the curve we all like to see in terms of AI. Next slide, please, Nicola. So on the supply chain, I just have only one slide for supply chain and we will talk about the data culture. That's the that's the change in this part of the discussion. But one slide just to give a sense of what we are doing in the supply chain space. So as I talked about a lot of manufacturing mining in that area, a big portion of that is about making the right decision of how much to produce where based on the demand. Demand also is a function of weather, political situation and all that kind of thing that production decision support is pretty critical for us. For a potash, for example, we are the world largest producer of potash. It is not for us about bring, bringing out more potash. It is for us bringing out the optimum amount of potash, because if we bring out more and more potash, then the world can consume it. Will, it will erode the price. That's not helpful for us or for anybody. So that's why that decision support is very important for us. How do we take the information of our regular forecast, financial production, historical data, and the futuristic forecast, hyper local weather data, etc., to find the right forecast for the for the operational plan for next year, six months, or whatever. And that this this prediction system, what it does is practically gives us a high level plan for the future, a more detailed level plan if we can ask more specific question to it. For example, what type of potash? we should produce in which site if we had 50,000 extra ton of demand. If you put that to the system, it will 
do a model. I think we use Monte Carlo in that case. We particularly come out with what what is the recommendation for that production plan. Freight analytics. This is we 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 have a very large fleet. We have we top 10 fleet size in North America for sure. And based on how you see that, we have thousands of rail car. We have lots and lots of trucks both here and in Australia. And what happens is where we send products, how we send product and the cost associated with that is obviously a big piece of the equation of our cost. And oftentimes we find the cost of transportation is equivalent or more than sometimes the product we are shipping. So it is very important that freight analytics and that cost management around that is super important to us. Uh, Nadak recommended this is typically for our sales team when they are making an order they choose from which warehouse uh, from which site or whatever what is they are choosing and the uh, and the date of delivery etc i believe somebody mentioned about the date of delivery is also important factor based on those it's recommend to the salesperson on the fly what is the potential net back we will have so meaning you might send the same product two days faster. It's like the Amazon Prime. You might have a different cost net back or profitability or you can a different day or from a different warehouse might have a different choices. The choices of time, schedule and the warehouse, etc. and the path the sales folks choose for some of our business decides what will be our profit for that transactions. And these are I'm talking about the bigger transaction, the B2B transactions. And so that is very important from the from the profitability perspective. We talked about I talked about safety. Safety is really our core values with so many trucks uh, always running around at any point in time 24 seven across the roads of North America. This is about analytics with the uh, telematics and the driver analytics and the, uh, all that kind of driver behavior and how to keep them safe and prompt, etc. That's the safety analytics part of that, which we also look at very seriously and the work I would say is kind of in progress in that path. Long way to go, I think. Uh, this has a lot of potential in the long run. The last but other thing I wanted to point out here, it sounds very simple, but when you have a very complex supply chain, and I wish it was a, a group of people like everybody was on the call together, like Sami and um, uh, everybody on the Fatma, everybody was on the call. Now I could ask a few questions. The bottom line is, it sounds very simple. Why can't you predict to a customer when the product will arrive? And trust me, it is not that simple when it comes from somewhere in the mine and then goes from Saskatchewan to somewhere else, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, and it goes to more than one mode, some cases intermodal. It is not that simple and funny enough, we are talking about many more predictions, etc. Even this particular information for customers is not as easy as how we see it in Amazon. So we are working on that a lot. Our goal is to give all our customers a predicted predictable delivery time to high degree of accuracy. We are getting there quite a bit, but a uh, little bit of uh, way to go there. Uh, anyways, after all this and there are many other such things going on, our our my vision is our vision is we'll almost have a supply chain hub. You call it a supply chain hub. You call it a command center, uh, whatever you call it, and we have not decided yet. Bottom line is it allows you to make the strategic level and the tactical level. Tactical level as my routing decisions, my tomorrow's decision, my today's decision. Strategic level, looking at the supply chain information we are generating over the years and making some strategic recommendation which can be applied in, in which, which the value ultimately goes to our growers. And, and ESG is a big part of that. I don't have any slide in this particular presentation on ESG, but ESG is obviously a very, very high priority for us. All of this besides the dollars and the cents is the environmental impact and how can we reduce our footprint and uh, do the right thing. That's also a big part of this. Nicola, next slide, please. So in our data journey, which which has been so far very, very successful, we had uh, we had four pillars or whatever you call it, like four strategies maybe and then one was unify. I, I talked about the story because our big thing was unify. Get meaning of the data because there was a lots of data for 14 ERPs or big systems. And now how to make sense of that as an organization? That was really big one for us. It might seems not very cool, 
but it was very big and it is very complicated. The next thing was, and then we had a lot of tools. Every tool you name it, we have it. Now, what is the right thing to use for what purpose? And rationalizing those was basic business we had to do. And then unlock the data advantage, whether it's through Excel or Power BI or AI or whatever, we were first to get the basic data advantage going. And that and that now initially started like that. That's where number three where AI fits in. That's where we are now unlocking the data with to the prescription, prediction, and prescription. I would think we do very little prescription, a lot more prediction kind of a thing so far, but that's where the whole AI thing fits in in my mind. Number four is closest to my heart, and that's what I'm going to talk for the rest 10, 15 minutes I have. This is empowering and driving the data competency. This is where the training comes in, but also the excitement comes in. And this is, I believe, a very important factor, more I think and learn about from my last several years of experience doing that. It is the most, one of the most important aspects of driving a data-driven journey within an organization like ours. Nicola. So this is a bold statement, as many of you might not uh, agree with that, especially in a AI conference or AI discussion, but this is my personal belief. Technology is technology arbitrage does not exist much, meaning what a company of our size have access to the technology and the technologies which are available, like you know, different technology with Microsoft, Google, Amazon, etc. And those kind of things, most people can buy or access the similar kind of things. What makes or break or changes is that people and culture, which is a difference here, how much willing people you have, how people are pulling this. We will talk about that a little bit. And that, I believe, drives the application. That drives the application of this information, the business knowledge and data that marriage happens, and then you see the outcome happening. So rest of 15 minutes, I will talk about the people and culture piece, which I believe is uh, super important. So this was my four strategic pillars, and I took a little liberty to use Excel to create a little graph, and it graph has no data, data-based meaning. It is just representative to say, even for unifying an operate, which sounds very technical, which sounds very subject matter-ish, you need people to come together outside their emotion and bring together. I have stories during the period when the companies were coming together where to agree on basic terms like what is the definition of gross margin? What is the definition of what should be included in the EBITDA calculation, what should not be? These were so subjected to some extent, I felt that it felt like is that the people who drives that to the conclusion. Same for the technology landscape. You all know and by your own experience how people get uh, passionate slash emotional about their technology, what they need to and want to use, and until they find that toy, they feel that nothing is going to work, right? And then obviously, the as far as the unlocking the data advantage is concerned, I believe it is 80% technology and 80% people and the culture and people pulling it, and then 20% uh, or whatever is the technology, right? And similarly, driving the uh, organization to as a data driven culture is definitely a people and culture aspect or the focus on that. Nicola. OK, so really, really summarizing what I was talking about in technology capability, the approach we have taken is listen, technology is not my biggest differentiator. We invest in technology capability at a pace which is about six months ahead of the business need. What I mean by that is in this world of cloud and world of partners, etc., you can put a lot of technology. If you are not leveraging those or sweating those assets, basically what you are doing is incurring cost. So, and how much technology is right for your organization? This is our definition of is such that you are at least six months ahead of the business needs, so that no no time, no possibly you will not get stuck for a business use case to be done because you are lacking that technology. So that's our philosophy, what have been, we have been doing. We are predicting that technology need and developing those technology and capability as the use cases are coming. And I we strongly believe then the next big thing on the technology side is the right data science. It's hard, 
And with this market, we all know finding the right people is hard and who has contextual knowledge is very, very important. Without basic business contextual knowledge, it takes a long time to just data tell you the story. I think the context completes the rest of the story which data tries to tell you. So those are important. But today, again, the big focus for me is the people and culture, which is I see it in five, five points. This is what we practice regularly. We think big, act now, start small, scale fast, right? This is our philosophy of we think, what are you gonna do the big picture, but we really want to get something small out in the open and get it going and create the excitement going. Change with empathy. This change, what we talk about in our roles, at least in my roles, hey, let's apply AI to a problem or a forecast or whatever. It's comparatively easier to say somebody who is living that role and doing that in a certain way for years or even decades, it's a big change. So we got to be empathetic about the change so that we can take people along the journey. Celebrate success and learning. It is absolutely important to keep the energy up. And for that, we need to celebrate success and learning. And uh, pull versus push. I think Harold, you were just mentioning about we, we, we want to pull. We want our partner to pull the training that will be more appropriate for the partner. I will touch upon those in a little more details in a minute. And then fit the future pipeline. We should be focusing on the current, what we can do, but also think about the future problems and the future opportunities we should be focusing on so that we don't find the pipeline dry. As I see through the presentation since the morning, I feel like that's the feeling the future. Like I'm talking about some of the things which are coming, uh, academics and the teams and the smart people are working on this. That's very, very exciting. Nicola, next slide, please. So a little more on that, some stories. Time to think big and uh, time to market is very important thing. One of our favorite thing we say is concentric circle. Do something first with a small group of people, then make it bigger, then make it bigger. So uh, this is when that uh, production forecasting system came into being. We had a new CFO and a new president for a business unit. Really one line I got from that person was how to predict the cheapest optimum ton, where to produce. And it is not a requirement document, this is an ask, and that's what you get. And then I got together with few people and uh, we kind of figured this out on a whiteboard that is a very complex and a complicated problem in our case based on how the data is, all the context, right? But what thing we did, we had a version within two weeks. Was the version AI driven? It was predicting anything? I don't think so. It was more of a visualization and etc. But the point is, I think that version was the most important step of this journey where we ultimately landed into a really good product. We still use it every day. And this product also got our president's award, etc. But that version was the most important step, I think. That version basically took all the information we readily have and kind of a little more and made it visualized in a way people could digest and understand and appreciate a little more than ever they did before in one spot. So that's my point about you got to think the big picture so that you don't uh, put it into the corner, but it is important, really important as far as I'm concerned, acting now and getting something really quick out of the door, which shows what you are building, which makes it tangible, which makes it real and give back to that first incarnation of the first iteration. And so if anything you take away from today, I would suggest really consider that it's a really different approach. Sometimes people feel that, wow, well, how can we do that in two weeks? Something, do something two weeks. And one other thing I do all the time in those kind of version and discussion, I start with saying is that today is an incomplete version or incorrect version. We even put in front of the deck red letters, incomplete and incorrect version. Magic happens when you do that. The whole stress of judgment goes away from the discussion because it is incomplete and incorrect. How bad it can be more, right? So that's the whole idea of this point. I, I really strongly encourage you to do that if you are in my spot or a similar situation in that industry where you are trying to push the data agenda within your company. Nicola. 
Change with empathy. I have, I have, this is this is really coded word, and I just kept it in my head. Maybe the words were exactly not same. I've been doing this forecast based on demand, talking to 20 people every month. How can you replace this conversation with a thing called AI, where people still think AI is a thing and it's software we bought sometimes in all organizations? How can you make it happen, right? So there are two things going on here. One is I have never done anything with AI, so I do not trust that. And second is I have an over uh, passion about what I do and I know what I do. I can believe that all those things I think through and the soft skills I have to do with task with 20 people to get that you can do by a system. So the two things happen. One is that doubt and uncertainty. And the second thing is they feel like they will fail. So I my point is uh, this is very important if you are doing at scale to understand and empathize, empathize with people and work with them and don't underestimate because we often say, hey, Look at that, they will never change. AI could do that easily, but you got to think from somebody else's perspective. So we are we are a, we were a, we were having a session uh, on compassion, which is kind of funny in a tech group, but we were having a session with compassion. I got a really good speaker. I met him in a different life at a different spot. Uh, he, he is extremely intelligent and very, very wise. That's the word come to my mind. And what happened was uh, one of the folks actually asked from my team that we talk about compassion is so important and all that. And on the other hand, we talk about AI or a bot answering your call, right? On the other side, how do you connect the two dots? I, I was surprised with the question. I was I was thinking in my head, how do we, I answer that question? I didn't know how to answer that question, but he said something very interesting here. He said that, uh, uh, a lot of the time, the problem with a call center or a help desk or whatever it is, they are over understaffed or a lot more queues, right? So you don't get an answer back or you didn't get a response back. What is the most non-empathetic thing can you do to a person? You call a person, the other person do not answer you back. However, if an AI solution because of its scale can constantly answer you back and more promptly answer you back and take care of your problem, Though it's not a human being, maybe though the solution did not connect with you humanly as much as possible, like how are you and how is your Tuesday going, etc. But at the same time, is actually catered to one of your basic need for empathy. This is the other side of the empathy, right? So when somebody asks me, hey, is AI means there is no empathy in that because it's not people or human. I think there's a lot of empathy can come from this. I will never forget that incident. I, I really. I really believe that a lot of that responsiveness, scalability, accessibility, or quality which AI can bring, I think we have to think about those and talk to people about those and uh, and be empathetic to people who are going through the change themselves, the subject matter expert the persons, the growers, the people who are doing the mining, etc. Nicola. Celebrate learning. So celebrate uh, the use case. Celebrate definitely the use case, but if there was a way to change change the discussion from use case to the people who has done that, like don't leave an opportunity to do that. Like do not forego an opportunity where you can do that. The example of the uh, forecasting or predicting for the production I talked about, the person we brought in to be the business leader, the subject matter expert on that actually got the president of ours, not the product itself. I was kind of incorrect when I said the product for the product, but the person. That is very, very interesting. A lot of people, when they see that, what, what did she get the award for? Oh, she did an AI model with those technical folks and did something really cool. That's interesting. There may be something to see there uh, and all that kind of thing. The other example there would be where you don't succeed. There are many use cases, there are at least few, where we did not get to the outcome what we wanted to get. So. One example was in one of our plants, they had three granulator machines. And uh, one of the ask was, hey, one granulation machine is supposedly not performing as much than the other two. However, they are of the same make, same year, same maintenance history, et cetera. We said, let's do it. That sounds like a really good AI problem. So we did that 
we all that kind of modeling and all that kind of good stuff. So what it turns out is we couldn't even conclude that the hypothesis which we started with that one is performing less than the other two is true from the data perspective. And what landed up happening there, we decided that we need to fix some of the calibrations and some sensors in the machines, etc., and let it learn for a, run for a couple of more seasons before we come and tackle this because the data couldn't tell the story, which we did. I think somebody asked this question to Fatma as well that uh, like, where do we start with the data or the hypothesis? That's an interesting example for that, I guess, right? We started with an hypothesis, but data could not justify the hypothesis. We had to find the right data before we can handle and tackle that hypothesis. I believe the hypothesis is true because the people who are saying and they are living that and breathing that every day. But again, you got to do the data part of it before you can action that. So in those cases, these are complex. Uh, we should recognize and realize that and this is not your day to day operational activities. L celebrating the learning and the complexity and uh, also recognizing the people who dare to go into your journey with you and do the learning is extremely important because failure is our biggest fear at workplace where people don't show up or don't uh, participate if, if that existed. Nicola. Generating the pull and the push, right? And then, yes, we did some mm, catalyst, embedded something interesting stuff, some, some, uh, some articles and all that kind of things within our internet and all that. Now we are in a complete mode of pull. We have pulled together a group of really interested senior people in the organization. Two sets of people we have pulled together. One is for the insights where it's more of the AI driven stuff and other for the general data and analytics kind of a thing. And I know they are not very clean and dry, black and white, meaning which one is which, but it's more of the standard operational data and all that. And this is more all that plus external sources of data like weather, like supply chain data, like ESG data, like time series data from the control systems, etc. Those are the insights. And we have a group of people from across the organization and we just facilitate as a, facilitate as a technology group. And this group of people generate those ideas. There is a discussion and that's where the excitement is created. One of those senior leaders has to be pulling that idea for what we go after. So in more than 90% cases, there is a significantly senior person in the organization is pulling one of the use case. I found that personally very engaging and very important because if that happens, then a lot of uh, other subject matter experts fall in line and a lot of good things happen and then suck the probability of success goes up as well. So this is the last time in my five points. This is about the uh, feeding the future. Feeding the future in these cases, we started this program, which is in May actually, not too far along. And we kind of started, and you might get a, uh, it's a little funny that the left one, most leftmost uh, course is a one-time course, I guess it's called Accelerator. The spellings are a little weird and by reason, we wanted to have some fun with that. This is an Excel-based course. And you will be surprised how many people joined that. And every time we had a course, it was already completely sold out. We had to say no to people. So when you do those first three courses, Accelerator, VizWiz, and Patron of Science, you become a Nutrient Data Citizen. And when we do the, the th fourth one, you become a Nutrient Senior Data Citizen. And the last one is more of a uh, more deep, uh, AI based AI and ML, all those kind of technologies we teach there is called data citizen. It is not for everybody. So that course we are working with Harold and the team and see what can we partner more to supercharge that piece of the course. That's our flagship obviously. And then uh, the other thing that course and the courses did so far, they generated an ongoing list of 700 plus ideas. These are people who voluntarily joined these courses from all geographies and all parts of our company, and they are trying to get themselves data citizen, senior data citizen designation and knowledge, and able to play with our contextualized scrap data 
and they are in the process of the courses. They are generating ideas. This is what is one of the big things we did in last few months. We feel is creating a lot more momentum and is democratizing the skills and the pool across the organization. So this is what we, we think is one of the big cultural nuggets which will take us uh, uh, quite a bit farther from where we are today. Nicola. This is my last slide and I'm leaving some time if there were some questions and I know Harold you are running a little bit behind as well. So uh, this is the thing. So we started we started with foundation and momentum. We had to get that because we, got, we are building up a new large company and then for 2021 we got to the mode of hey uh, 20 plus 20 plus one because in 2020 we did 20 AI type use cases and then our goal in 2022 plus is uh, 10 plus market what the use cases what I mean by that these are really big which uh, requires a which demand which uh, relevant for a press release that kind of a thing and at the bottom which is key for us is having a really data savvy organization and the organizational quotient for data we are still working on how to measure that but really taking the quotient up quite a bit notch that's the key for us and uh, and that comes with uh, this, this journey. And uh, we are relentlessly focused on value uh, more than technology, as I spoke about. And that's what we drive through driving the culture and creating the pool. Harold. OK, great. Well, that's uh, thank you so much, uh, DB. This has been excellent. I'm uh, I feel like I'm watching a motion picture or a movie here. This is excellent. So. I'm going to give you some tough questions. Sure. Your early slide, 25,000 employees. And I'm going to guess uh, attendees here are, don't have that many people in their company. And, and, you know, to make this as practical, because you've really broken this into little chunks here, two questions. What uh, AI tools or, or tools, not to call them AI tools, would you recommend for their tool belt, if you want to call them that? And the second one is, how do they start? How do they start? Yeah, so that's a good question, uh, uh, Harold. So honestly, I think from the technology part perspective, starting has never been so easier, right? Because think about when we were developers, you had to put a server in place and a software in place and network in place and then internet to develop something. I think they can go to any of the three like AWS, Microsoft, Azure platform or GCP global platform. Most of the tools are there. If you have one or two skilled people in your organization, you can get going. The only thing I would add there to me, get going is take something which is interesting to important people and which is not so difficult and get it done versus starting with writing a big strategy document and a plan for AI. And I would rather do some stuff and get something done in a short order. OK, that's great. That's very practical. So uh, two, 2018 wasn't too long ago, uh, so I'm sure you'll remember. Now when you look back, there's going to be some pain along the journey. Uh, looking back, what would you have told yourself in 2018 now that you've learned what would you do which would you have done different I, I think a couple of things right i think we took a little while to figure out uh don't talk about ai and don't talk about technology and we did not do much but i think we should do at all talk about the problem and the opportunity and work on the solution and i think on the partnership side uh, we took, took us a while and a few dating to figure out who should we partner with and how uh, because it's not easy. It's a lot of companies are there to help and they kind of offer the similar services and platform and which one you want to choose. Uh, I think that took us a little bit that dating and the dance part of it. OK, well, I mean, we all learn on the process. Um, the last slide you had there, 700 new ideas come from your 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 team uh, in the, how am I going to say this, uh, the SIA citizens, uh, our, our Yes, data scientists, and I don't know why my team does that, but you know they are they want to be creative too. So, yes. So how are you yeah. how are you going to take those seven hundred ideas and 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 you have to ring them, uh, put them through a filter and a funnel to get to the 
to the best ones because your goal for 2022 is only 10 projects. So, yeah, so we do. So a couple of things on there, right? One of the things we do in our organization, we call it hypothesis culture is very, very much in our DNA. So a lot of my team in this case, going to the 700 ideas, they already categorize them based on the big ideas, big thinking versus the similar or happening or the people, the person who put the idea didn't know about this is happening and that kind of categorization. After that is done, there will be some will be small little things to do at and the others will be put in front of that group. I talked about the steering committee to see, hey, what will be a good value for money for next year? Again, our relentless focus will be what is the not the coolest thing to do from technology perspective because we apply AI for our business. We are not a AI service providing company. And, and what is most valuable for our company and uh, what can be effectively delivered. That's an important aspect to that. Sometimes people start very complicated use cases and it goes for years and they never show, see the light of the sun daylight. What happens is technology and the need sometimes change between that and which is not necessarily a great uh, outcome. Okay. Okay, so um, one last thing and you don't have to answer this one if you don't want to. Can you share one success that exceeded your expectations? That just solved with AI or implementation of AI, something to that effect. Yeah, I, I think the one we are working about at the supply chain hub will be the biggest one I think we have ever done because that will be almost like, hey, whatever, call it Alexa, Google, Siri, whatever. How do I do my decisions on this? But I would say the production planning I talked about the first one was the first biggest one. As I say that got President's Award and all that. It was the first biggest one I felt that was an unlocking moment for the organization to look at this is cool. Excellent. Well, you know what? Uh, you're right on time here. Um, I thank you again for all your talk. Any final parting comments to our, our attendees? No, I think if you offline to Harold or whatever, ever want to reach out, but I, I really, really emphasize my, my suggestion is drive with the culture and get some stuff out in, out in the uh, out, get it delivered and uh, you will be fine. Okay, so actually I just had a question that come in through the chat box if you have time for one more. Sure. How would the process have been different if you didn't have the catalyst of the Agrium Potash merger? Could you have pulled this off as a quote unquote business as usual scenario? Like this is, I don't know who asked that, probably they know the person maybe even know me or somebody, but this is a really good question. I uh, thank a lot for that inflection moment of this merger because that is a change moment which I we really leveraged and got into this momentum. I believe we would have still done something similar in the legacy status quo, but it would have been lesser momentum and not not so fast probably. I, I just don't know, but honestly, I don't know that, but I feel that we got an advantage to the merger and the event of the change and the merger that, that helped me a lot. But, but isn't, isn't indirectly COVID that inflection point for many companies? It, it is. I, I think COVID is an inflection point for the, especially in the supply chain context, right? I, I, we talk about even servers and PCs. Now people are like, oh, this is a supply chain issue going on. We have to be careful which server we go to. We never had that discussion in the last 10 years. So it is also an inflection point for sure to think. Again, everybody's business context is different. And I think I, I think I think the other way to answer that is look for that inflection point and that event in your world. There is always one and pick that one which can help you generate that momentum. Well there's always that a quote there's the pain to do and the pain not to do. Pain and not to do. you know and in this case here where would you be if you had not embraced AI? Oh yeah, so I, I honestly think like, I think we, we got to do, if, if we didn't do that, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I think we will be quite a bit behind and our numbers might have not looked as good or whatever. But the more important thing is, this journey is also important as much as the outcome. Because people, you, you are, we are dealing with people and if people are not doing quality work and moving towards the future of digital, they feel that they are in, stuck in the archaic. Don't underestimate that piece. We regularly say now we are a technology core organization. Technology is not just an enabling function. It's a core of what we do and that is what will transform the business. And several other projects we started which might not be of AI that also has a direct correlation with this. Like the good work we do, bring good work and 
organization take a leap of faith to use digital as large to get going. OK, well, again, thanks again. I, I love your backdrop there. What what oh. crop is what crop is that? Uh, that's a good question. I can't tell you for sure, but I feel like so maybe, but I may be wrong, so I don't want to say that. And OK, yeah. well, thanks again, DB, and uh, really, really appreciated you being our keynote today. Uh, we've had some uh, some questions that have come in, so uh, I'll just uh, say thanks and I'm just going to give some closing remarks. Thank you so much, Harold. Thanks for having me. OK, so we have, uh, you know, we've had some great speakers today. We focused on the AI for um, supply chain. Of course, there's going to be things you're going to be uh, on driving home tonight or if you're at home, you're going to be thinking about and you want to follow up. Here's my email here. I can connect back with the with the uh, presenters and uh, really appreciate your questions. But more importantly is is your next steps. And uh, you know, like the, the repeated messages start now. And if you don't know how to start, you don't know AI, uh, AI, again, you can reach out to me. We're here to listen to your challenges, your needs defined in your terms. And then we'll figure if AI is a solution that help can move that to the next level. So again, thanks all for attending today. And uh, again, there's my email, hgodwin at uwaterloo.ca. And that's all for today's event. And uh, have a great day.